Uh, nothing comparing to do a mile of 25 degrees uh, with the macular buckle or something like that. <laughs> and, and a hole in the middle. And PVR. Okay, Luca, pass the video. It's time to start. I will salute every one of you then after yes. the video. Go yeah. ahead, Luca. Oh, I don't have it uh, prepared, the video here. Okay. So. They're not ready. So, can I go ahead? Yeah. Okay, so good morning, everyone. Thank you for being with us in another webinar from Borrowing Cinema Productions. I'll start as always from west to east, saluting each one of everyone of each of you, of you. So first one, good morning, America. How are you, Christopher Riemann? Thanks for being with us. It is great to be here. Thank you for having me, my friend. Thank you. Second, bom dia, Brazil, my lovely country. Hudson Nakamura, how are you? I'm okay, a hundred percent here. Everything is all right. I'm listening that uh, the temperature in uh, south of uh, our country is pretty cold. It's pretty chilly, but it's okay here. It's sunny. <laughs> Thank you. Buenos dias, Argentina. How are you? Hello. Thanks for the invitation. Very well. I'm waiting this webinar. Thank very cold. Much. Very, very cold. <laughs> I know, I know. Bona tarde, Catalunya. Benvinguts, Carlos Mateo. Como estás? Oh, nice. Nice. Your Catalan is pretty good. Uh, you know, no, I'm fine. Thank you for having me in this webinar with this bunch of uh, perfect surgeons. Thank you very much. Thank you for being with us. Masa al Khairia Masar. Ahlem Fik Hassan Mortada. How are you, my friend? Ahlem Fik. I'm fine. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. It's um, really uh, an honor to be among um, these distinguished surgeons. And um, greetings from uh, Egypt. Uh, it's summertime now. I, I was supposed to be on the beach, but uh, but I have to work. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for being with us. Kalispera Elada, Carlos Irfate, my friend Athanasios Nikolakopoulos, welcome. Kalispera, it was always nice. I had the same problem with Mortada. I had to be in the office, but I decided to go to the beach. I mean, Exactly the opposite. That's yeah. That's why Mortada is so famous. <laughs> and I'm asking. But uh, thank you for inviting me. It's, it's a great honor to be between those great people and be at the beach at the same time. Thank you. Now Japan, where it's very late. Kombanwani home. Yokozo, Yusuke Oshima. Genki deska. Hi, right, thank you. Thank, thank you very much for including me in this very great team. So, your Japanese very nice. Yeah, right now it's 9 p.m., a little bit later. But still very good to get the presentation here. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you for being with us. And last but not least, my partner, co-organizer and brother, Luka Mishev, Doburden, Bulgaria. Bon dia, Gustavo. I'm happy to co-host another meeting with you. And I'm looking for an exciting meeting. Okay, perfect. So we don't want to lose any more time. Our first speaker will be Hudson Nakamura from Goiânia, Brazil. He is one of the greatest surgeons here in Brazil. He works at, at the Eye Bank in Goiânia, which is in the middle of Brazil. Hudson, don't forget to unmute your microphone and go ahead with your presentation. Okay, nice to be here. I'm starting to share <coughs> the screen. And uh, this is a pretty interesting case of a patient uh, with uh, retinal detachment. I'm going to start it off now. Can you see my screen, Rob? Yes. No? Yes. Yes. Oh. This is our city, Goiânia, here in Brazil. We are at the IBEC Foundation. We are presently here now, and uh, this is a case of severe, severe PVR retinal detachment. Uh, very, pretty tough case. I started the case doing the uh, inverted vitrectomy. The uh, patient had this uh, huge retinal detachment, and uh, we were not able to see whether the retina would uh, anyhow attach because it was so. Uh, detached you know, uh, with uh, too much PVR. And as you see, I had to relieve all tractions from the retinal periphery. 
We had fixed folds. We have uh, a lot of anterior PVR shortening of the retina. And so I didn't quite know whether we would be able to attach this retina beforehand. Because as you see, the, uh, it, it was kind of uh, like a funnel, funnel type and uh, the retina was not very mobile. You see, it's still stuck at the retinal periphery. I was afraid of uh, trimming too much and doing too much retinotomy. And uh, then uh, I could have the retina rotate and then my task would be very difficult to go on. But then I started to relieve the uh, tractons. And uh, as you see, you have too many cysts in the back of the retina there. And the retina is starting to get mobile and I'm doing some uh, subretinal work to remove RPE cells from the uh, subretinal space. And uh, the retina is getting, you know, more mobile now and I'm getting more keen at doing more things here. I could have uh, probably uh, given up at this time, but uh, I think we could probably have a pretty nice case. So I, I continued with uh, the vitrectomy and now when I went back to the uh, retina, I saw some bleeding, you know, so this is an intraoperative complication. So I had to get rid of the uh, blood. The blood was subretinal, pre-retinal, and uh, also over the uh, optic nerve. So I had to spend quite a few time to remove all these blood. Otherwise, I could uh, probably follow with the uh, PVR and uh, make it... Uh, the, uh, the surgery is not feasible in the post-operative period as well. But then here I started to use a cautery. I'm dealing with uh, retinal periphery now. We had uh, more bleeding, but uh, now the cautery goes on and we did a lot of cautery at the retinal periphery. But now I can see that the uh, edges of the retina are pretty flat. So the case is getting better. So uh, I, I'm uh, wasting some time here to do the cautery and now I'm serving the SPFO to attach the retina and for my surprise the retina uh, was not so bad now I had the retina attached up to the periphery no fixed folds as the macula the periphery was uh, pretty flat and uh, uh, the macula the retina was pretty good looking now I started doing the laser and uh, the uh, laser uh, was taking very well. I did uh, one, two or three rows, actually three rows, very linear around the retina to get it stuck. And uh, for my surprise, the, uh, I was trying, changing the outcome because uh, you know, at the beginning we saw the retina so bad with so many fixed folds, I, I couldn't actually uh, know whether it would attach or not. But now it's attached. We did the, this uh, 360 degree laser, and uh, we are starting now the uh, PFO or silicon oil direct exchange. I prefer not to use the uh, mechanical system, so I, I get it manually. So I insert the, uh, the photocarbon, I um, mean, the silicon oil, and then remove the, uh, silic the, uh, the photocarbon. And see, the retina looks pretty, pretty good, amazing view. And uh, you see, if you look at the macula only, at the macula, you, it seems to be quite normal. So it was tough, but ended up uh, well, fortunately. So that Amazing. was my case, okay. and uh, I'm happy we, we could uh, get this uh, done, you know, because when we start, the surgeries with cases like that, we think well, we might stop, it might not work. If we do too much retinotomy, we uh, might get the retina rotated, but nothing happened and uh, it was pretty uh, well attached. And uh, we have so many complications out of uh, sclerobuncles, out of uh, so many inflammations and uh, PVR out of holes and uh, RPE. Uh, cells and displacements and uh, but this uh, went okay. Thanks a lot. Congratulations Hudson. Very difficult case. I want Hassan Mortada to comment it please. Yeah. Um, thank you Hudson for uh, this uh, wonderful technique but uh, if I 
wherein in your place I would do it um, in the reverse way. So I would start from uh, the disc posteriorly, um, staining, trying to remove the um, epiretinal membranes and the internal limiting membranes. So it is actually a peeling of the internal limiting membrane starting from the disc and moving to the periphery. Um, because I strongly believe that uh, removing the ILM is uh, crucial in these cases. It is the scaffold for reproliferation. If I started, if I start from the periphery, then you may have rotation um, of the retina fold. Um, um, if I was seeing well, uh, there was a fold crossing over or coming over the optic disc, and this means that there is still uh, traction in this area. So um, briefly, I would start from posterior to anterior. And um, if I uh, need a retinotomy, then I would do it as, as the last step in the operation, not at the beginning of the operation. So I, I, I may uh, deal with this case uh, differently. Yeah, yeah. But Excellent. because, uh, you know, I started with the core vitrectomy and then we moved all vitreous and uh, the necklace started to look okay. So I went ahead for the retinal periphery, you know, the peripheral work, peripheral work, because you saw this anterior PVR, we didn't have much to do unless we uh, did retinotomy. But then I was doing the retinotomy progressively. I started uh, uh, 90 degrees or 80 degrees and I was uh, looking at the retina and uh, trying to avoid any rotation as well. And then after the uh, uh, periphery, I'm very familiar when I use PFO, after using PFO, and uh, if I think it's necessary before placing the PFO inside the eye, I don't exchange, even though the retina is detached, in the air fluid exchange, and uh, die with the uh, brilliant blue, and then I could look at the ILM, but I didn't think it was necessary to remove it because I, uh, used the PFO, the retina got flattened, and the macula looked, looked pretty good. And uh, I've been following this patient so far, and uh, his retina is pretty attached and with no PVR. And it's almost uh, five months, and uh, it's time to remove the uh, silicone oil. I agree with you that uh, we could probably have to start anything uh, from the uh, core vitrectomy, but uh, I did it. You know, I spent quite a long time in the retina. And macula, but then I had to move ahead to the retinal periphery because of the anterior PVR. Okay, before we move ahead, Chris, 30 seconds. So 30 seconds. Um, I, I think that uh, for me, I agree with Hassan. Um, I think I might have uh, put in some dye here in the US. Brilliant blue is a little bit difficult. I would have put in ICG then um, let it sit for a little bit, and then I would have put PFO in under, uh, under the ICG. Uh, I agree, it's sometimes very difficult to peel ILM uh, when you have a total retinal detachment, but uh, I would have tried to reattach um, the posterior pole, peel the, uh, probably peeled ILM, because the visualization in this case was excellent, um, peeled ILM off the macula, and usually you can get uh, when you peel the ILM, you'll get a little a little finger of PBR that's that, that's extending posteriorly. You can get that little finger at the edge of the ILM peel, and then use that to catch the anterior PBR. I'll always try that, and if I can't do it, if I can't get the peripheral retina to lie down um, by removing traction then I'll proceed with the anterior retinectomy, but I'll always try a posterior uh, peel first um, and, and peeling with forceps. And if I can't relieve traction to get the retina to lie down, well, then we move on. Thank, thank, you, so thank you so much for our next speaker, Gaston, please go ahead. It's yours for those who don't know and are watching us. Gaston was my fellowship professor in Buenos Aires and he is one of the best Surgeons from the new generation Argentina, he organizes uh, Retina Extrema. Gaston, go ahead. Okay, you see the, are you seeing? Yes. Thanks for the invitation to this webinar called Complicate Retina, and also thanks to Gustavo and Lucan for the invitation. I will show you my learning curve in 27 gauge. In the past, we used drive cars, and today, they are these motorized buildings. We went from conventional surgery to 20K, 23, 25, 27. 
and often the most difficult is to adapt to changes. Here I'm using the Alcon Hyperbit that I think that it's a very good thing to use and we have 2,000 cuts per minute and dual pneumatic technology. And also in this video, I'm working with constellation and ingenuity. Here we can see the retina detachment. In a young patient, in young adult patient, the high load management is the key. Uh, I use Tramsinolone, is mandatory in young adult patients. Here we can see the strong adherence, very, very strong adherence because of the age of the patient. I highly recommend to use chandelier in this kind of patients. Why? Because if you see better, you can work better and also better for the recording quality. We have here we're using the, the proof. I usually tick the retinal tear. I think that that is very important. The younger the patient, the greater the adherence of the highlights. Here we can see the, the, how we are going to extract the highlights. But the problem in many cases is that many times it is impossible to extract it, it's entirely because with each maneuver we can generate new retinal tears. So we must be careful. I usually use the finest loop for multiple things, like releasing blood clots or releasing high loads in extreme cases. Here we are aspiration of the subretinal fluid. I, here we're doing the fluid air exchange with aspiration of the subretinal fluid. The key of these cases is the hyaloid. I also tried <clears throat> with a revolution handle with a max grid tip to try to separate the hyaloids, but in some cases it's impossible. Here we are, the, we can see the complex extraction of the hyaloid membranes. Here you can see with the revolution handle, I tried everything in this case. Then I will put silicon oil. Here we can see the highlights. in some part of the retina. Also with the brush, here we have <coughs> active aspiration. We're going to do the laser. When the retina was applied, I put silicon oil. And then I will take out the trockers and we can talk a little of the 25 valve trockers. What are the benefits of 27 gauge? Less post surgical inflammation, reduced post of scarring, and improve incision closure and accelerate visual recovery. Also the patient comfort. Now we are going to see images of the post off. We'll do the post of OCT and also I want to show you the dual blade designed with continually open pore reduced fluid turbulence that in this case will be very useful and also as we increase the number of cuts with a dual blade design we increase the vitreous flow rate the peak traction force and the bevel tip design facilitated improved access to tissues plane. I think that technology is a very good tool. And today, 20, today's 25 and 27 gauge are more resistant, more efficient to their predecessors from previous years. Thanks for the invitation. Mm.
I'll jump in here. That was a, that was a beautiful case, uh, 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 Gaston, a beautiful case. Um, you know, I agree with you. I think the 27 gauge vitrectomy, especially with the Hyperbit platform, is, is a very powerful, very precise tool. Um, I think the performance of the 27 gauge dual blade uh, cutters are, uh, are, are at least as good as 25 gauge single blade cutters. Um, um, the interesting thing about this case, um, you know, I have gray hair, so I'll just, uh, uh, um, so I, I'm an old, tired, fat guy. And uh, in these young cases, sometimes you get in, you know, you, this ended well and, and, and bravo for a wonderful surgery. But in these young cases, sometimes avoiding the vitrectomy altogether and doing a primary sclerobuckle um, is, is a very nice way to fix them. So in a young primary retinal detachment without a posterior vitreous separation, um, I'll usually start with a primary sclerobuckle and skip the vitrectomy unless I need it. Thank you, Chris, so much. Yusuke, your opinion, please. Your, yeah, no, yeah, I quite agree with uh, Chris's opinion, you know. Even I'm the pioneer 27, I don't like to use it with the young patient, especially the young patient without PVD. You know, the young patient that created PVD is very difficult, even with the 27 or any other instrument. You need to take care. Uh, you know, the primary case, the young patient, the first line, even, even don't care about regards to young surgeon or old surgeon, the primary buckle is the best way as the first line to treat such a young patient, I think so. Good morning. Yes, I agree with your opinions. That can be another approach. Uh, sometimes I do sclera but in this case, I, I don't think like an option. Uh, I really, perhaps, I it will be a good option in this patient also because it has two retinal tears, but, but the problem but the, that the retinal tears were at different places and at different heights. So if I do a sclera buckle in, in this case, uh, perhaps I would need a, fi a future vitrectomy, but it's, it's okay. I agree. Carlos Mateo, your opinion, please. Uh, two things for me. Um, one, I, I agree totally with the scale buckle. I think in this bunch of surgeons I, I am <laughs> who do more scale buckles uh, combined with vitrectomy in, many, in the majority of cases, then, you know, I agree that this is up for primary uh, scroll buckle. The second thing I want to say is that, you know, um, white fill um, uh, lights are not very good for to see the vitreous, are very good for a recording, but not, not to see the vitreous. And the third thing, is that if you change to silicone oil in an eye with you leave part of the you know posterior hyalot attached, it can be a mess. You know it can contract, and then it's very difficult to remove after after you know I, I you know if you can not remove the posterior hyalot, don't use silicone oil because you know you're dead. You know it will contract, very difficult to to manage, and many breaks, and and uh, you know this is the only thing. But you know nice nice surgery and. Thank you, guys. So let uh, Lucan, 30 seconds. Yes, I want to comment about vitreous visualization and white field uh, illumination. We used to uh, use only try and see on about that. But uh, in recent uh, surgeries, I tried the fluorescein, intervitreal fluorescein with modified ingenuity uh, <coughs> digital filters. You can see the peripheral vitreous like glowing in the dark. And not only the surface of the vitreous, which you can see with triumphs and alone, but you can see all the stroma of the vitreous up to the retina. So you can clean everything with wide field viewing illumination. I don't know if you, if you, uh, I know how you take the pressure of the patient before the surgery, but if you, you know, you put drops of fluorescent drops in the eye to, to, to see the pressure, you will, you will have fluorescent in the vitreous, then it will help you just to avoid to, to inject, you know, the, um, um, fluorescent in the vitreous cavity. You will have it from the, from the drops. Um. Yeah, but you need at least six hours for that. There are studies which are showing that. So, Inside the vitreous, if you lo uh, use low concentration, mm -hmm. there is no danger at all. 
Go ahead, guys. Tanasis, it's your time, please. Yeah, I have to wake up first. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm, old people get a snooze. Uh, first of all, I like very much the presentation of uh, of the young guy that has silicon oil, and uh, I also like very much the the new instrument from Alcon. Unfortunately. In Greece, the Alcon says that because we are in a crisis situation financially, we cannot afford to have this double glazing, double blading. But uh, in Argentina, you don't have a crisis, okay? No, we live in continuous crisis in Argentina. Oh, that, that, because they say that. So I'm going to ask them to bring me one of those because, uh, from Argentina, okay? I'm just complaining as usually all people do that. So back to something that I want to discuss with every one of you, if I can, because an observation I made, and uh, this is, a, I'd like to mention some complicated retina detachment that uh, people think that they are simple, straightforward detachments. And let's go back a little bit to the vitreous base anatomy. You know that the uh, distance is three millimeter uh, and uh, from one side and three, two millimeters from the other side, so from the aura. And the special thing about the vitreous base is that the, the extends in this area, but these fibers are very difficult to disinsert during surgery and they extend radially towards the vitreous gel for several millimeters. So the vitreous base is a very important issue for our surgery. But what about posteriorly inserting vitreous base as an insertion of the posterior haloid membrane being located posterior to the vortex veins? And it can be uh, very tough to read, to, and redetachment rate is much higher in these cases. Uh, I found myself, when I found out how difficult it is from one case that I'm going to show you, uh, and I call it zipper syndrome, because there are multiple tears in one meridian uh, in a retina detachment without PVR. It, just, it looks like a simple detachment. And also, you can find them in an A-touch retina. You don't have to go only to the test. There are tears in the A-touch retina. And they, all of them have a posterior base insertion. And they give the impression of a continuity that acts like a zipper that can open all of them together. So it's a multi-hole future giant tear. You can see in my uh, picture now here, uh, what, it, what am I calling this uh, posterior base traction that it is 360 degrees. And the first case we did was uh, with the Ingenuity in 2016. Unfortunately, I cannot show you this 3D video because um, I don't have it, but it was a row of tears, 360 degrees, and then we, did a video on this that looked very, very simple. And I can show you now. Looks like a simple vitrectomy that has some superior tears. And uh, you can see that the nice mobility, half of the area is detached, half of the area is attached already. And then we found ourselves to the periphery trying to clean uh, as much as we can the vitreous from the detached and attached retina. It's a main goal that we have to do, every one of us, if we want to have it. And then we found this. It was like a small piece of blanket, 360, and no matter how much we use the cutter, how much you decrease or increase the cutting speed or whatever, it doesn't come in. It's not cutting and you can see it lively how difficult it is to remove this thing. You cannot pull it. Don't try to pull it. You'll pull the retina. You cannot cut it. And then we found something uh, that there were tears 360 degrees around the eye. And uh, I don't want to be particular on that because I have 
the next step of the operation in another small video. And you can see that in the area of ATAS retina, there was a series, series of multi-hole in the same exactly meridian, one after the other, like a train. Attached hole, attached hole, attached hole. And I had to do some laser on them. And you will see that there was this detachment with a very ugly hole there that we usually drain through the hole and engage and inject air uh, in order to survive from peripheral carbon to be less expensive. And we tried to flatten it. And you see inferiorly, we had already done a lot of laser on ATAS retina, and then we flatten this with air and, uh, and we use gas exchange to change that. So what are the thoughts behind that? The thought is that uh, vitreous saving, it's a much more difficult uh, when, uh, uh, and there's a much higher reduction rate in these cases due to tear opening from the traction that we cannot remove. Zipper treatment, if we recognize that because we go to the periphery and we find this 360 orientation, uh, a simple primary vitrectomy is not enough. Uh, I agree with Matteo for this. 360 laser might be a rule on those cases, but, and I want to insist that, it might be very useful to have a 360 buckle indication because they are all in the same place. Nothing is anterior or posterior. It's like soldiers one after the other. And sometimes I would think of silicon oil or C3F8, even in cases when we don't have TBR. This is the only cases that I might use that. We had 26 uh, vitrectomies with this indication as soon as we found out there is. 13 have more than four tiers, 11 have multiple tiers in a touch at retina also, and all they give you the impression of an incomplete giant tear. And you know, our master, Makime, used to say progress comes from doing the unconventional. So unconventional is becoming conventional in this case and with a buckle. Uh, I always take advantage to tell you that most of you are teachers and connected to Thessaloniki Vitretna Summer School. And we have a motto saying that before you start anything, learn how to finish it. And uh, I would like to, uh, to remember uh, always our founder and friend and great surgeon, Cesare Forlini, because I always say that you are dead when the people forget you. So I don't want to forget Cesare. So it's a co-organizer and you can see Riemann explaining very simply with two sketches, how to suture a lens. And uh, the technology of the artificial eyes training is very important and we use bionic eyes. And here you can see the setup with uh, extremely good surgeons sitting up and through the ingenuity. And we have also in the training camp, we have also the OCT, the training OCT. And this is the setup we have. And it's very much attributed to you that you're coming like Cunning, like uh, uh, Riemann, like everybody else who come in here and, uh, and do it. Thessaloniki, it's a beautiful city. Uh, we changed that to, to October 26 to 28, 2020 to train people. And imagine we have 36 of you training 30 people. But we have a lot of fun all together. And you have to start young in order to become old as we are now. And this is my son and my daughter trying to learn how to do this. Thank you very much for accepting me to this phenomenal group. Thank you, Tanasis. This was really nice. And for those who are watching us and haven't been there yet, I really recommend going to Thessaloniki. The mood is amazing between surgeons, the students, the city. And Tanasis is a great host, the best you can have. I really recommend it. So let's talk about the case. Uh, who here has experience with Buckle? Because this moderator doesn't have, I want to listen to you. Mateo, of course you. You are muted. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, Thanasis is a great surgeon. He's a very, you know, has a great, great, great experience doing 
peripheral vitrectomy. But you know, as he said, it's not that easy to remove the posterior vitreous base. It's not that easy. And you can promote breaks and you have to, you know, to be very, very, you know, skilled to, to, to try to find any small break you perform during this, you know, radical, this doesn't exist, radical vitrectomies. Then, you know, I, I fully agree that in this case, I, I do it in all cases, but, you know, I, I really agree that in this case, you know, a buckle is, you know, a must to avoid, to promote breaks and to help the retina to be reattached. Any contrary opinions? Anybody has the balls to oppose Carlos Mateo? I'm curious. So it's Lucan, hard to oppose. You are left. It's, <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's hard to oppose somebody when he's right. Um, um, but I'll... I'll I'll, I'll, I won't say that in this case it's a must. I think that um, I think that Thanasis uh, uh, was 100 percent right. When you, when you're when you're shaving and shaving and shaving, and you see that anomalous posterior vitreous base insertion, um, and and you see, I, I, I love your term, the zipper, you know, the zipper phenomena, because you see all these little tears, and the more you pull on them you can end up with a, uh, with, with a big, they'll just coalesce into one big giant retinal tear and it gets very ugly very fast. Um, you know, when you find yourself, if you can shave and get the traction off, you don't have to put on a buckle in these cases. But if you can't get the traction off, instead of pulling, 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 okay, push from the outside with a buckle, support that break with, uh, with a 42 band all the way around and, uh, and, and, and it can sometimes, uh, it can sometimes avoid the, 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 the drama of the oil. I think that in this case, I would have, I would have, uh, I, 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 I'm not sure if I would have put on a buckle, but I would have been thinking about it very hard. Yeah. And the other thing also that we have engineers here. So you invert the vectors when you have the buckle. So the effect is the opposite. It's going to help you something. Look on, you raised your hand. Yeah, I just want to add, albeit I'm against uh, scleral indentation, uh, I want to remind that uh, Zivojnovic years ago used to put a uh, prophylactic, lose 360 scleral buckle in all his cases, and his claim was that he creates a new aura serata. So this is the same here, and I completely agree with uh, uh, Tanasis. Listen, you are very young. To know Zivojnovic. <laughs> he didn't. He didn't exist. <laughs> uh, I didn't exist. Yes. <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry to say that I was trained with Relio in 1983. So I wasn't born yet. But, yeah, that's what I mean. <laughs> so uh, we have a long discussion on this issue, but you have to remember one thing: we didn't have wide-angle uh, systems then. Yes. So we, we can see only 30 degrees inside the eye with the contact lens. So the real reason is first that he used a two mil, 1.5 millimeter uh, buckle, which was not a sponge. It was a, 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 a silicon yeah. tire, round tire, which he bought from mechanically in produced. And it was bought in five meters, six meters length. So it cost nothing. So the cost effect was nothing. And the whole idea is to bring the periphery to the center to be able to view the periphery. Because otherwise, you couldn't do scleral depression. You could do anything with 30 degree contact lens. Uh, and uh, he, when somebody asked him, why are you still using it after many, many times in Britain? Right? He told me in front of me, of course, this is a personal experience. He told me, now it's something like a voodoo. It takes me five minutes to put it because he put it under the muscle without suturing it. He just make a last suture, yeah, just 360 degrees and push it a little bit just in order to be able to see the periphery. And just because I think it's nice to, to remember the history, it's nice to remember Cesare, nice to remember Relio, because Relio was the one that we supposed to say thank you for whatever we're doing. And we take it for granted now. We take for granted PVR, we take it for granted wide angle. We take it for granted removing all the traction. But he was the first talking, talking about that. Uh, and if I would like to go back a little bit about my case, I would like to ask you, do you have a similar experience 
with a posterior base in the continuous steering and you have to be especially careful on that is it a special indication or is it in my mind because these are very very bad cases very bad cases you try to pull the posterior hilo to to the anterior part and then you break the retina and and you break, make one break another break another break and you say what 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 are to do next and then you got desperate yeah, you know, you know what I'm doing now that when I see a case like that, when I see the patient and he has 360 degrees in the same meridian, I put a three millimeter sponge around it before I start vitrectomy with my illumination pipe. I don't use the indirect anymore. I use the illumination pipe because it's, and, and I make a buckle of 360 degrees. And sometimes if I drain a little bit by accident, while I put in the suture, it stays flat and I don't need to do vitrectomy. It's crazy. It's so simple to do that. 360 degree, three millimeter buckle, four sutures, and that's it. And so uh, it's not that I'm, a, oh, it's an, a new identity that it looks simple when you have a partial vitrectomy in one quadrant and you say, I'll fix it in 15 minutes. But you have, I would like to ask the people who are attending to that to be very, 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 very much uh, careful when they have this zipper syndrome. I would like to put it back and say that don't take it easily and with Matteo and we agree with that uh, in everything and I would like to ask also Ogura who is a specialist in vitrectomy doing everything, incredible thing if he has the same idea he has seen the same cases or uh, Mortada who is doing hundreds of cases uh, do I have your opinion on that if this existing or it's in my mind Hassan, you are muted. Oh, yeah. Uh, very nice case. And uh, I, I like doing buckles. I do buckles a lot. You know, we did um, years ago with uh, Dr. Diveni from Canada, my preceptor there, and Dr. Lam. We did a work on the square buckle vitrectomy all together. And uh, we increased likelihood of having the retina attached with... Uh, no, not too much uh, PVR uh, remained after doing the two procedures at a time because you remove the uh, RPE cells and uh, many other things. So uh, I like using the buckle because the buckle, if you do a 240 band, for example, in the retinal periphery, especially inferior, and uh, unless the retinal detachment and the PVR is so posterior, if you do that from the vitreous base, you know, very peripheral there, and then you do vitrectomy, you have indentation, and then the likelihood for the retina, for the inferior retina especially, to get attached is a lot better because you have this uh, 90 degree uh, from the uh, band and the retina, like the retina ends, and you have a buckle, and so the buckle supporting the retina, especially inferiorly. So very many people don't like doing buckles anymore, but I like and enjoy it, and uh, it works, you know, at least in my hands. Thank you, Hudson. And we have 30 seconds for Hassan now because we have to keep the schedule, guys. Sorry. I know the... You are muted, Hassan. Sorry. No? You have to unmute yourself. Okay. Now, yes. This is not an uncommon uh, finding. And um, as the message said, it is a, a project of a giant retinal break. Um, and it is due to the circumferential contraction um, of the, along the posterior border of a vitreous base. Um, although I don't pl like to put a buckle in every case, but in these cases, I would prefer to put a buckle. But I did not see Tanasis doing a spiral indentation because if you indent the sclera um, over this um, uh, uh, vitreous uh, or membranous vitreous, you can have it, uh, you can approach it with a probe. So it should not be left like this because if, if it is posterior located, then where are you going to put the buckle? So we have to relieve some of the traction from inside. My, my objection on the buckle um, is that the location of the buckle, where are you going to locate the buckle? Because these, uh, posterior border of the vitreous base 
are usually posteriorly located. And if we uh, re remember the rules of the buckle, you have to support to put the buckle to relieve the traction. And not anywhere, you cannot put the buckle at the equator because usually in these cases, the circumferential contraction is posterior to the equator. And it is um, seen in myopic patients. So I would put a buckle, but at the same time, I would do a scleral indentation, bring this area of the vitreous to the probe, and you can shave it with, with a probe after stabilization of the posterior retina with PFCM. So it is not impossible to shave this vitreous. Um, it is possible by doing uh, deep scleral indentation, but um, as you all agreed upon, I would put a buckle in these cases, although the location of the buckle is not um, theoretically uh, agreed upon. Very good comment, Hassan. Thank you so much. Sorry, guys, we have to go forward, okay? Our next speaker is our great friend, Yosuke Oshima from Japan. It's a great pleasure to have you, Yosuke. Go ahead. Hi. Well, we'll share you some case here. Can you hear me? Yes. Well, I, I prepared several cases, but because the time limitation, we only show uh, two cases here. Uh, just wait a moment. Uh, this is the uh, PBR case. And here this patient is uh, around the six, eight years old guy. In short, uh, within my pr uh, practice with long standing attachment, I like showed it uh, right upper panel. The video is 0.1, 2200, but they refused to the, the surgery, or the surgery because they have a very hard work. So just uh, two uh, weeks after he came here with uh, uh, hypotony and a uh, very severe uh, great attachment as like shown here, and visual acuity decreased to the uh, 2400. And that, uh, we try to do the surgery to the patient. And because of the, the tear is not uh, uh, identified before the surgery, so I need to do the proposal to direct me to uh, find out the, the uh, bricks and uh, Removed all visual. And unfortunately, this patient is osteohyaloid. So, as you know, most of the patient without PVD. So, this maybe looked like very easy, but actually, maybe a live through tough case. So, here is Jerry. I usually, in this case, I prefer to remove the anterior capsid contraction like this way uh, to uh, keep the uh, visual field. And you see, there's very severe detachment, uh, core detachment. So, uh, initially input the, the one and infusion, and then try to uh, use the external drainer, use the trochal cannula, and then you can see we can extend the space there for uh, intravitreal uh, vitrectomy. And then you can see the PVD, I created you the 25 gate curtain. Uh, personally, I prefer you the 27, but in such a tough case, I still prefer you the 25 gate because sometimes I need to pre perform some uh, special manipulation at the periphery area. So, because the fragility of the 27 gauge and uh, especially the case with PBR or under PBR, I still prefer you to 27, uh, 25 gauge. The key point in this case, you need to uh, remove the membrane as much as possible. I show here, you know, even though I have not yet found out any breaks here, but still find the very, uh, there are several uh, layers of the membrane. And I need to carefully to shape the membrane. As you know, the 10, this is the 10K, uh, 25 gauge uh, hyperbeat cutter. It is very useful to remove the membrane as much as possible. Previously, in such a case, I need to use the forceps. Right now, I prefer use most of the membrane. I need to, I only use the cutter to remove the shaving. Uh, but in the very special uh, location, I still need the uh, bimanual technique to remove the membrane. As shown here, there are several membrane. Even it already create the uh, PVD. The very thick membranes still are attached to the resin surface. So this case may be some inflammatory reaction already occurred in this case. 
uh, shown the peripheral area, those are some vascular abnormality. So it's not simple uh, primary attachment case, I think. But anyway, that not sure, uh, I didn't, didn't know the, uh, the origin, but you know, uh, we need to gently and uh, carefully to remove the membrane to avoid any region breaks. Uh, most of the cases I prefer you the, the recite with the wide arm viewing system because very clearly you see the surface the membrane. And there are several layers as you shown here need to remove the membrane. And finally, I can remove as much as possible. So not the same, quite same the last case that not just uh, showed, but this case also the very severe attach, uh, perfect uh, uh, vitreous attach here. So if I uh, uncarefully create a uh, bricks, iatrogenic bricks, I decide to need to perform a scarring buckle. But as shown here, I um, am lucky to not, not to make any breaks right here at this time. So I tried to only use the vitrectomy without buckle at the first, uh, first uh, surgery. And of course, as shown here, I uh, need to pr um, remove the membrane around the, the macular area to prevent the secondary prefibrillation. So my, I prefer you to uh, stain the membrane with the BBG and then stabilize the uh, mobile retina with uh, a peripheral carbon. As you hear, I use the forceps to remove the RLM underneath the peripheral carbon. Uh, this technique can clearly see, you can differentiate uh, the peeled area and unpeeled area. And at the same time, you can use the peripheral carbon to stabilize the attached retina. And then I go back to the peripheral to refine gently to find out. We, I, I, uh, at the end, uh, finally, I can find that uh, I found a very small breaks, very small break around this area. So I put the cryo and then <clears throat> uh, perform the free air exchange because most of us are free already uh, aspirated from the original hole. So I only use the C3 for the gas to uh, conclude the surgery as here. This is the first case. And I'll show another case, much more severe case, the PVRK. This is a long-standing PVR case, but it's a primary case without any uh, previous surgery. This patient had high myopic eyes, so didn't under, uh, aware of the, the detachment for a long time. So it visited my practice already like this situation. So uh, in this case, as again, I use the wiring system and the bimanual technique to Perform the ampitrectomy. As shown here, you can you can see a very large original hole, uh, uh, <clears throat> the uh, temporal area, and then you also because it's a high myopia case, the PVD and not occur completely, and the very tough thick membrane adhering to the retina. So need to gently and carefully to remove the membrane. But as you as shown here, the long-standing uh, PBR, you know, the original really shrinked, shrinked very severely. So uh, most of the peripheral area are very clearly can remove. So this is not anterior PBRK, just a PBRK. So only the uh, inferior area, there's very strong shrinkage. Again, I perform the arm peeling underneath the powerful carbon. So this area cannot completely remove the attraction. So I decide to put a small area that uh, lesnectomy to fraction retina. Again, I show the periphery is very clearly uh, the picture also removed without any severe contraction. This is not under PVR case. So I decided my as my first surgery only do the lesnectomy with laser and uh, uh, gas terminate without any buckle. So the third case is very much more severe. Uh, this is a cold uh, traction detachment is, uh, case, the young patient. So there was severe detachment with the prominence of the free. So I decided to perform the uh, external drainage first and then extend the interregional space to insert the trocar cannula. This is my, my very old case. I still use a non-bubble the cannula. And you can see the very thick membrane, again here. And need to use the bimanual technique to remove the, the membrane because this is a cold case. So this uh, also have some uh, vascular abnormality and uh, very uh, severe inflammatory reaction caused the membrane. So the restriction, the very uh, strongly uh, contract membrane. Because this is uh, the anterior case, because you are shown here, the membrane that connected to the peripheral area makes a very, very 
uh, strong contraction. So uh, because this case, you know, you, you cannot uh, differentiate, you, you did not make the not. So in such ca several cases, you need to buckle at the initial spree. And in this case, you know, they have those of the fast formed traction at the posterior area. So after the move all the membrane, you cannot uh, flatten the region completely during the surgery, but after you need to perform the buckle to support uh, the previous area to make a new serrata. And again, in this case, I uh, you only use the gas at the first choice for this PVR case. And there are, this case, very lucky, we can uh, flatten region, the attached region now only with a single surgery. They may be uh, sent to the buckle so you can uh, complete surgery very, uh, completely only with one surgery. Okay, uh, just our case. Okay, let me stop sharing your screen, Yusuke. Let's see back here. Congratulations, I love the way you deal with the posterior highlights. It's so important to take it off because for sure you're gonna have a PVR. Gaston, please, I want your comments on that. <clears throat> No, I think they're very good cases, Oshima. I will probably do the same. The only difference perhaps can be an idea. In both cases, I will do the internal limited peeling. I will try to do passing the equator if it was possible, but uh, I think that the resolution of, of, of Oshima was perfect, I think. I, I don't do, uh, it's okay, it's very, very nice cases. Hassan? Um, I totally agree that um, dealing with a strongly adherent posterior hyaloid, um, as in cases with a steroid hyalosis, which is the posterior hyaloid is known to be strongly adherent, and these cases should be dealt with uh, by manually, just as uh, Oshima um, uh, have done. And um, you cannot uh, peel the posterior hyaloid without only single handed. So it has to be. Uh, by manual. I uh, totally agree that in cases of um, uh, PVR, especially bad PVR, as uh, just shown, the eye lamp should be peeled uh, as much, uh, I call it extended eye lamp peeling because it has to reach as far to the periphery as possible. And um, as we said at the beginning, we have to um, consider uh, retinotomy once the anterior PVR is so bad and so cannot be dealt with. So we have to consider retinotomy. In um, coast disease, you are lucky to achieve a retinal reattachment with only one operation. In uh, yeah, very lucky. Only with gas and not with um, with silicone oil. So um, nice. so um, it's a um, very very nice surgery. Carlos Maceo, so my... please, please. Sorry, before before you, you Just Wait. a second maneuver that Yusuke showed, but he didn't explain it. He, he explained about the manual surgery, but he didn't explain one maneuver. This is amazing. This is to grasp with the two forceps and don't pull the videos to you. It's pull the videos apart. Don't try to pull the videos to you because you are going to break the retina. And Yusuke right. yeah. showed in the video, but he didn't explain it. But you know, the maneuver was perfect. You know, pulling the membrane and not pulling to you the retina because you break the retina doing this. And Yusuke, wonderful surgeons. Wonderful. Yusuke, yes. Yeah, so uh, the one argument about the PR case that use the tabernate substance, they use gas or use silicon uh, oil. So personally, you know, my mentor, the Yasuo, uh, already told me the first choice should be the gas because we also very scary about uh, sub silicon oil proliferation, you know. So we're really lucky, of course, in the, the cold case, I'm very lucky, can um, conclude the surgery, only one surgery, but you know, if it's a late perforation occurs, I have no way I need to use the uh, thick oil or something. So I have less uh, experience about thick oil. So I will show you another one case here, you know, uh, this is another very interesting case. This is a case consulting me from other practice in uh, this case, it's uh, traction, uh, the transplantation. After that, in a silicon oil field eye, you can see the very severe proliferation. But it's because this is in the trochal cannula uh, uh, surgery era, I 
didn't remove the signal at first. I performed the remove the membrane underneath the signal first because if you remove signal first, you will encounter total detachment. So just only as a sample about the subsequent wave perforation so severe. So my personal, personally, I don't like to use the signal as the first choice. Of course, if in some case you cannot perform the face down, a spine position, I have no way to use the second wave. Otherwise, I still prefer to use the, use the gas as the first choice. How about the other surgeon? You encounter, if you encounter some substitution or perforation, how can you overcome this uh, complication? Uh, th that's a that's a beautiful case, uh, 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 Yusuki. A beautiful, beautiful case. Um, I, I get a lot of uh, uh, co uh, consultations from other practices as well, and I found that two port vitrectomy under oil without removing the oil, the oil acts as another as a third hand and holds everything sure, in place. Sure. It's a it's yeah. a very nice way to do things, and you can and and you can take a, a very complex surgery and make it pretty simple. You can even apply dye under the oil bubble if you use a uh, if oh, you use a, uh, <laughs> um, a a soft tip to just gently inject it under the meniscus of the oil bubble to help with visualization. That was beautifully done. So I also wanted to comment. I also wanted to comment on your on your earlier surgeries. I really love your uh, your the way you thought there. Right. You 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 started with the vitrectomy. You peeled posteriorly, and, and that's the key thing, right? So in, in general, and there are some exceptions, as we saw earlier, but in general, when you're, when you're dealing with these complex retinal detachments, you want to you look for membranes posteriorly. Um, in general, you don't need buccal vitrectomy. So I, I don't think any of us do a lot of buccal vitrectomies. We, I'll do wow. a straight buccal for a young primary retinal detachment without a vitrectomy. Most primary retinal detachments, especially in pseudophagic patients, can be nicely handled with just a vitrectomy. And these cases that we're seeing here are unusual cases, the zipper syndrome, the high myopes, the, the anomalous sure. vitreous base insertion. Um, and, uh, and, 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 the, and, and I think, Yusuki, your, 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 your thought process is very much like mine, and I think also Hassan's. Um, you start the membrane peeling posteriorly and uh, uh, peeling under PFO if need, if need be. And then, and then if there's retinal foreshortening, then you can do a retinectomy and or scleral buckle. Um, I, I just love, love what you're doing. Thank you can so I much. Ask Thank you you. Can I, Connie, can I, can, I, can I ask something? Yes. Uh, just uh, one question to all of you and if you can answer that. Usually we're showing techniques now that they are addressed to very experienced surgeons. It's not for everybody, what we're doing there. And the, uh, the question that I got a lot of times from other ophthalmologists is, this case is long-standing PVR. Is it worthy to do it? And for what reason? What is the visual acuity at the end? Nobody's telling me, it, you, you're telling me it's a flat retina, successfully. And, uh, I got my own ideas on that, but I would like to ask you also, what is your answer to your colleagues or to the patient? What kind of visual improvement they have or what kind of visual they had before in order to achieve uh, a successful case and say that I did something better for this guy? So I, I, that's a really important question. And I think that the most important answer to that is, well, it depends on what's going on in the other eye. Um, if the other eye is a prosthesis and, and, and there's no vision, then um, heroic surgery to take somebody from hand motion to count to, to, you know, or light perception to hand motion or from hand motion to count fingers makes sense. But um, if the other eye is 2020 and, and you know, then, then, then perhaps, perhaps we can be a little bit less aggressive. Certainly in the setting of, of cost containment, um, blindness in one eye is pretty inexpensive um, as opposed to heroic surgeries. Um, here in the U.S., I, I, you know, um, I, I, if it's a multiply operated eye and the vision doesn't, and the visual potential isn't any better than hand motion, sometimes we'll leave those eyes be. But if we can get some peripheral vision and some counting fingers, um, um, then globe retention and, and cosmesis as opposed to a slowly shrinking eye progressing towards tysis and needing, needing a prosthesis. Um, I think that's a reasonable indication to do these heroic surgeries. 
I would like to ask Agora on that. I mean, uh, Osima on that. Yeah. Not a good. So that's, you point out very nice question. Already discussed with the patient about the issues. Because, you know, the last case I show you, it's called a very young case. So we are not only discussed with the, himself without the, with his parents. You know, it, even though this case, we can ex, if the patient, we, if we can expect we can get the visual acuity better than the count finger or point one more. I don't think it makes sense to the surgery. But if the young patient, the parents or himself also want to do, I try. But I won't talk about them, only one or two chances. Because, you know, do several surgery, you cannot get better results. And if it's a young worker, you know, if uh, the outlook is very, very important. If you, you fail to the surgery, you also can encounter some other, you need to find with the prosthesis or other, otherwise you will look the outlook and good out drinking. So we discussed this issue with the patient several times, they discussed with the official of the very, uh, very severe case. It's a very old guy. I, most of my, my case, I discussed with who gave up about surgery. You know, it doesn't make sense as you told. Uh, I'm more aggressive than you are. And I have my own visual thing that I, I would like to, to say. Uh, first of all, uh, people that they have one eye, which is yeah. much or less blind, they close this blind eye in order to see better with a good eye. That's right, that's it's right. That's projecting, right. It's projecting the dark yeah. through the yeah. crossing to the other eye. So yeah. first of all, I'd like to do to everybody in order to have a visual field that mm -hmm. it would not stop him from seeing with the other eye. The second issue is that with silicon oil and not with gas, I keep the physis out of the question for a long mm -hmm. time, especially I'm using only 5,700 Sandy Stoke silicon oil, which is a great improvement, the silicon oil results and to what you're afraid of. And third, these people that they, I've seen a lot of surprises, people that they have barely uh, vision or whatever, just light perception. When they're flattened the retina, they come and say, thank you for having hand motions. Uh, it's, it's a great improvement to have your visual freed of this eye and to, and to have a nice looking eye for a long time after that. So uh, to my mind, I never stop doing a case on the basis of vision because mm -hmm. you always, when you're successful, you always have a patient who is grateful. Nobody comes and tell me, a doctor, I cannot, uh, I cannot read the paper or I cannot do this or cannot that. Mm -hmm. If you explain them correctly, it, they are happy by just removing the blindness from one eye. So I'm with you all the way, but people starting asking me, and because this is already for everybody, this seminar is not for especially technicians or doctors. I wanted to put that, don't send them all these cases, even if they are six months, seven months, one year old, send them because they might have improvement. People from the ophthalmologist, they say, don't have to go to the ophthalmologist, your eye is lost. That's Refer true, Thanasius, uh, excuse me. We, we are very late and we have to go on, but the discussion is sorry, sorry, sorry. very sorry. important. No, don't worry, don't worry. Yusuke, thank you. So our next speaker, as Thanasius say, when you are extremely intelligent, you become crazy like Riemann. That's the first thing he told me about <laughs> when I was in Thessaloniki, and I totally agree. So, Chris, please, the screen is totally yours. All right. Let's see. So, um, uh, uh, I've been doing uh, heads-up surgery for a long time. I'll start off with a simple case that doesn't have a video. Just to, just to show some some uh, some Riemann re craziness uh, that helped a patient that had a difficult situation. So this is a 90-year-old man with uh, with a macula involving retinal detachment lasting for three weeks, and and for every year of his age, he had a degree of bent back syndrome and kyphosis. <clears throat> so. The question here is how to deal with the positioning changes. This man could not straighten his back out to more than uh, to, to, to less than a 90 degree curvature. So we did some gymnastics with the uh, stretcher and, and, and maximized the positioning. But even with, with stretcher gymnastics, 
we could not get his angle any better than 45 degrees uh, 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 towards his feet. So what we did is we prepped him and we draped him and we used the Hogstride scope, which has a, a very ag a, a, a aggressive way of being able to tilt in both directions. You can go almost 90 degrees. You can turn the scope almost flat um, uh, towards you and away from you, put the camera on, and, uh, and then just did the case heads up uh, with comfortable position. You know, in the past, we would have done this uh, standing up, leaning forward, and th that's very, very awkward. Um, but this was a routine, relatively straightforward case um, that ended up doing well. And the idea of being able to uh, do gymnastics with the microscope as opposed to with your C-spine in these cases um, is, is, is a nice way to uh, handle them. So uh, first case, this is a previously sutured CZ70 IOL, sutured uh, by, uh, at another center 10 years previously. The, previous, the, the CZ70 is the single piece M uh, PMMA lens with eyelets. Um, and, and back in the bad old days, people would suture those with 10 proline, And we now know that after 10 years, those 10 prolines rupture and break. So what we're planning to do here is to rescue this existing CZ70 lens. And uh, we'll, uh, we, we start off here making two sclerotomies. I've opened the conjunctiva, uh, 27 gauge surgery because the, the vitrectomy is mostly done. And I take a loop of Gore-Tex suture into one sclerotomy, out the other sclerotomy, and, um, and then externalize it through a small paracentesis. And then I do this little maneuver that some people call the Riemann twist where I create that little twist in the Gore-Tex. The Gore-Tex has pretty good memory. Um, you can do this with the chandelier, which I'm showing here. Uh, it's a little more fiddling, but you can do it without the chandelier as well. Uh, one forcep or two forceps, you take the twist through the existing eyelet of the intraocular lens. Then you open the twist and put the end of the suture, uh, the, the, the loop that you've just put through the eyelet over the end of the haptic. Uh, you pull up the lens and, uh, and, and then the, uh, tie the Gore-Tex suture. Um, I like to over tie this Gore-Tex suture because, uh, because uh, Gore-Tex can slip. Then you rotate the knot intraocularly. And in this case, I didn't quite get the angle right because I didn't know exactly where the other uh, meridian was. But if one of these prolines uh, broke, Certainly the other proline probably is going to break as well. So we're gonna go ahead and break that, repeat this maneuver. Here's the, 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 the little twist maneuver. Again, put that in the eye, uh, push the lens posteriorly. Again, the twist goes through the eyelet um, around the haptic. And now we can center this lens very nicely um, and, and position it, close the conjunctiva. Of course, we do scleral depression. Um, closed the conjunctiva, and he went on to, to, to get back to his baseline visual acuity. He did very nicely. Um, <clears throat> here's another interesting case. This is a 38-year-old uh, patient that I've been taking care of for over 12 years now. She's had multiple surgeries, tube shunts, so on and so forth. She had two reticerts to control uh, her posterior uveitis. Uh, the most recent one was seven years ago, and this was right before they switched over to the uh, right before they switched over to the new, uh, better adherent uh, way of adhering the pellet to the tab of the reticer pellet. So uh, she com came in uh, complaining of a floater, and uh, and described symptoms interestingly of photopsy. So as this pellet, this lux pellet, was bouncing around in the back of the eye. She would have these explosions of photopsias um, that, uh, you know, pr presumably from the, from the pellet impacting the retin retina. So she came in telling a pretty compelling story. So uh, here's the surgery to remove that Lux Redisert pellet. <clears throat> 25 gauge here because I want a little bit better uh, infusion flow. We open up the Redisert wound. Uh, the conjunctiva, we open the tenons capsule over top of that. There's usually a little bit of uh, fib fibrosis, fibrosis of the tenons capsule. It's important that you get down to the sclera. We're opening the, uh, we're opening the, uh, the, the red assert wound. I use a 0.3 tooth forceps to grab the old silicone retinal tab um, before it falls into the eye. And then uh, you use 
pure suction on the red assert pellet to lift this into the retro iris space. We hold it in place with suction and then reach in with an intraocular forearm body forcep and uh, grab the pellet from the cutter with the suction, remove the pellet. We birth the pellet and, uh, and, uh, and then close using a, a, a running, running vital suture. Um, her posterior uveitis, it was more of an intermediate uveitis, had burned itself out. You see the vasculitis there. The old vasculitis had burned itself out and had been inactive for a long time. We gave her an anterior subpoena on skin log to help with, um, to help with uh, 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 uveitis control after tickling the uvea here at the pars plana, and she went on to do very, very well. Um, a third case, uh, so this is just uh, showing off intraoperative OCT. Um, uh, viewing, this is a vitrectomy with membrane peel. And um, so this is, you know, intraoperative OCT is a big question mark. Is it, is, is, is it useful? Is it not useful? I will tell you that it is, uh, I think it is useful. Um, it is not a must have for every single case. But if you're going to use intraoperative OCT, it is very, very important that we're able to visualize the OCT in the full resolution. So this is the Hogstripe microscope and ingenuity <coughs> and, uh, and using uh, the constellation. And you see here, the, uh, this, th so this is, I'm operating off the screen and you can, you know, uh, and you, you use the auto range finder and you see that you get the full resolution of the OCT that gives you the information that you need with a little bit of epirethral membrane, a little bit of intramacular traction. Um, and, uh, and, and some poster hyloid. And, and, and so here you can see with split screen viewing, I can aspirate the poster hyloid and I can go back and forth very quickly between the live surgical view, which is in 3D on the right, and the OCT. And I can actually confirm by OCT live while I'm operating that I've lifted the poster hyloid here. Um, I'll, uh, I'll fast forward here a little bit. Putting in, when you put in some dye, you lose the intraoperative OCT. Then, uh, then at, when the dye is gone, you can see again the, the macular pucker. It's there. It's not a horrible macular pucker. You can see that the resolution is much better when you're looking at the OCT on the left than if, when you're looking at the image injection, even though the hog image injection is much better in terms of resolution than the Leica or the Zeiss image injection. Um, and again, here, while we're peeling the membrane, I find myself going back and forth between the OCT and the membrane peel to actually confirm what I'm doing. It's very, very interesting. So we're just at the very cusp of, of starting to uh, uh, use the intraoperative OCT. Um, if you're going to use it, it is very important that you have access to the full resolution image on a screen that is very close to however you are seeing your primary image. And split screen viewing here with, uh, with, with, uh, with Ingenuity is very, very powerful. Um, and, uh, and, and again, so I'm gonna freeze this here. You can see how nice the OCT looks on the left and the image injected OCT looks good, but the detail is just not there. So it's important to look at it. Um, and here you see it again. You can see the layers on the right. You can see, um, and, and you can see the OCT, but you cannot see it as well and with the resolution that you can on the left. So um, uh, last case is a, is a quick case that we did just recently. This is a patient with megalocornea, uh, previous ret retinal detachment repairs, previous IOL reposition, uh, uh, fixated to the iris with tenoproline now has another dislocation of the intraocular lens with a, broly, uh, with a broken iris uh, a proline suture. And of course, this nice man is on Coumadin. Um, so what we decided to do here is reposition him using uh, a, a kind of a Yamani style technique. Um, in Coumadinized patient and anticoagulated patients, I like using the smallest gauge surgery possible. We uh, kind of take the capsule remnants off of the IOL. Um, and, uh, and now I realize that I've actually placed my uh, trocar with the bevel in the, in the wrong direction. So I replaced my trocar 
I grab the hyloid, the, the, the haptic, pull it out, um, create my little Yamani uh, 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 giz, my, uh, bleb on the end of it. Um, then um, do the same thing here on this side. And what you'll see is as soon as I pull it out, oops, the first one goes right back into the eye because this is a megalocornea eye is really, really large. Um, so again, we create this. Um, it's best to do this with the Zeiss, uh, with, the, uh, with the Zeiss IOLs that have thicker haptics and the, and the thin bore 30 gauge needles, but you can do it with a, uh, with, with the, uh, you can do it with the, uh, uh um, trocars, um, very nicely. And, and this patient went on to do very well. Um, at some point, we're going to probably suture in an iris prosthesis in this eye because uh, he's got a lot of glare complaints. So, thank you. Thank you so much, Chris. Lots of many cases. The first case I loved how powerful 3D might be. And we have many 3D users here. But first, Futsu Nakamura, which of the cases of Chris you like the most? I love them all, but uh, I'm going to ask you uh, about, uh, I guess, uh, your case is very good. Very good, Gaston. And uh, the Please, fit to remove the pellet. Yeah, uh, the, the fit to remove the pellet. Uh, how uh, would you uh, remove without using PFC? You did not use PFC. Do you think it's necessary to remove the uh, PFC? And uh, also the sclerotomy. When you took the uh, pellet out of the eye, how much would you enlarge the sclerotomy, uh, Christopher, uh, to get rid of the, uh, to remove it, actually remove it without uh, getting too much of a low pressure? So, um, it, you know, they, they say that you need a five millimeter sclerotomy to put this in. You know, whenever you're putting hardware in and out of the eye, um, I always, you know, if, if I'm going to make a five millimeter hole in the eye, making a five and a half or a six millimeter hole is just not that much more of a big deal than, um, than making a five millimeter hole. So I've gotten, you know, you know, with, with, with gray hair and having made many uh, surgical decisions that I've learned from and, uh, and, and choose not to repeat, um, I, I found that I tend to make my sclerotomies a little bit larger. Um, with the constellation, you have IOP control. IOP control really helps to maintain intraocular pressure. If you're worried about that, you can actually do a 23 gauge surgery. Um, you, know, uh, you know, the DORC system has that high flow infusion cannula that snaps on the outside of the, uh, of the infusion um, you know, so, so, that you, so you don't get globe collapse. But you know, the key thing is to, to when, when, you're, when you're moving the eye when, is, is to not gape the wound. So if you're, if you're applying posterior or anterior pressure to that sclerotomy, you're gonna take that sclerotomy and you're gonna gape it open and, you're gonna, and, and the eye is gonna collapse. You have to get the angle just right. You have to look at it as you're going in with the foreign body forceps. You go in with the foreign body forceps. You, you don't go into your posterior and, and you, you, you know, I'm, I'm holding it with suction from the vitreous cutters. I didn't use PFO. Um, and you just reach across, grab it in one smooth maneuver and pull it out. And, but what if the uh, pellet comes out with the only aspiration, wouldn't it be better to, to use the forceps uh, at the beginning and just uh, grab it and uh, lift it up? So the uh, so our our intraocular forearm body forceps are the the old Alcon. Uh, they're like 18 gauge forceps, um, and they're very very wonky uh, in terms of uh, of you need you need you need high grade mode uh, gross motor function to actuate the slider. We don't do that many intraocular forearm body cases, um, and 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 your the control that you have with those. If you're picking something up off the macula of a patient that's seeing well, um, it's just not that great. I prefer to do those maneuvers uh, a mile away from the, uh, or, or, or a kilometer away from the, uh, yeah. from, from the macula. And that's why I lift it uh, with, the, with suction from the cutter. Yeah, it's a lot safer. Congratulations. All your cases are just great. Mortada, you were shaking your head. Yes uh, or no? Do you like uh, well? Well, I um, I like to use um, helium. 
instead of uh, PFCL or PFCO, because if you inject helium uh, beneath this um, dislocated whatever uh, foreign bodies um, IOL, so if you inject helium, it elevates the object from the surface of the retina and it protects at the same time the surface of the retina. And most important is that it limits the mobility of the object inside the eye or, or the foreign body inside the eye. So I prefer to use helium instead of PFC, PFCO um, in order for these three reasons. It helps uh, to protect the retina, limit the mobility, and um, assist in um, elevating it from the surface of the retina. And, and the nice thing about Helon is it also protects the retina in the event of dropping that foreign body. You know, sometimes it comes out of the forceps, you try to pull it out of the eye, and it drops back onto the, uh, onto the posterior segment. The Helon will protect from, from, that, from that impact. Especially yeah, with that's a, heavier that's a bad on. experience for PFCL and lifting things from the surface of retina. I, I'm, I'm, I'm pleasantly experienced in removing huge amount of nucleus from the surface of the lens of the retina, and I found out that correcting. I, I fully agree with Riemann. You cannot touch anything that's sitting on the retina because you cannot control how much pressure you can press against this through the retina because you don't, you cannot control uh, your, your weight or your strength to that because it's minute that you think. And I put it as a must that you have never to touch anything that's sitting on the retina at lens is encapsulated. Everything else you have to lift it in the middle and try to catch it in another way. The second issue I have, I never use peripheral carbon in this object because usually when you try to mobilize the eye and get something, peripheral carbon is going sideways and it's not sitting anymore on the back of this, but it might sometimes cover it up instead of being behind it. And then it presses against what you have. So you don't, if you lift things, you don't need the PFCL. You just work in the middle of the eye. And if it drops again, nothing really happens because a, a lot of things drop down. I just remove it again by suctions, bring it in the, in the center of the eye and everybody, everything working in the center of the eye. And the, the, the last thing, I, I try not to remove anything from the sclera, five or six millimeters. I don't like lenses. I, 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 we here in Europe, we do combine things all the time. We do. So I would much prefer, if I had the option, to do the cataract, Take it remove out it the from the cataract, put a lens, and keep the the, the, the area of the sclera to, to, to the minimum uh, opening that you have for a trocar. Uh, I don't like sclera opening. He, he had so many things from incarcerated vitreous to, to hypotony to, to, to a lot of turbulence in the eye. And there's no real uh, rehabilitation for the sclera. The sclera never, never, never closes 100% at the end. Uh, that's my, my side of it. Carlos Mateo, you wanted to say something. Let me, let me be controversial, as always. <laughs> you know, yes, I want blood on the arena, please. I prefer, by far prefer garo liquid. Let me tell you why. Not because all of this, you know, because when you remove the foreign body with the perforocarbo liquid in the eye, you have the opportunity to turn off the infusion line. Because when you break the retina in the periphery, when you remove the foreign body, it's the vitreous you, you have anchor in the foreign body and the forceps that you remove. If you increase the pressure of the eye, fluid carrings go to the sclerotomy and all of the peripher peripheral vitreous go to the sclerotomy and then you can promote peripheral breaks. But for a carbon liquid weight is double than the water and then you can turn off the, the infusion and you gently remove the foreign body. I prefer to use uh, uh, for carbon liquid. At the end, another another trick is not to do a linear, not to do a linear uh, cut in the in the in the square, but to do a square, a square incision. You you have the vertical one, and then you make a horizontal one, and it permits you to to have no so big, you know, horizontal breaks. And then with only one suture in the corner, you again turn on your 25 or 23 or 27, whatever you use. 
I prefer to use. Mateo, I bring you some blood. I bring you some blood. First of all, you were pre-valved surgeons. When you got valved infusion and you don't have turbulence going outside of the trockers that you work in, it's much more stable, this. I, mean, I agree with you. When you have flow in the eye, that's going outside, you're moving. And the second thing is, you are not allowed to move anything inside the eye if you don't completely remove every bit, every bit of the vitreous around it. I, I'm a true believer on complete inspection before you remove anything from the area. And uh, with trocar, you don't have this turbulence. But I agree with you that if you have a turbulence, it might be a problem. And it, you don't put a half a cc of perfluorocarbon behind it in order to survive. Uh, you disappear. I think he lost connection because he's in the beach. No worries. When all. <laughs> So uh, what, what I want to, I, I just want to show one real quick case, all right, that, uh, that I think is really interesting uh, uh, to, to support uh, what Tenesis was saying. So this is a case with an intraocular uh, foreign body and um, an intraocular foreign body, metallic intraocular foreign body. I did this, this was in 2004, uh, before we had, there's the foreign body. We did a FACO. I'm opening the primary poster capsule. I'm taking the extraocular electromagnet, foreign body electromagnet, magnetizing a pick. And if you look carefully here, watch the, the, the magnetized pick, the foreign body just jumps up to the pick. You can take the, uh, and, and then I very carefully bring it through the primary poster capsule axis, push it into the viscoelastic filled anterior chamber, and then remove the foreign body from the anterior chamber uneventfully. Put a lens into the capsular bag, and, uh, and and this I went to do I went on to do very well. Great. Well. Imagine a twenty-four years old boy, and you have a hydrographer for the body. Would you remove and you know um, a clear lens? Second, imagine that this is a minus six diopters in myopia in both eyes. But this is the refraction you're going to 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 leave the patient minus one and minus six. And you know, you know, an isometropia can be a problem. Then you know, in a young patient, this is very, you know, if the lens is, you know, and many of these cases are young patients because many of them are young patients in the trauma with these foreign bodies. Then you know, to remove a lens in a young patient is not that you know, if the lens is clear, uh, I think I, it's not a good thing. Totally agree. Well, but in, in this in this case, no, in, in this case, uh, that was a young patient. That was a 27 year old or 20, 24 year, 20, 26 year old patient. It was 15 years ago, uh, 20, and he had siderosis bulbi and a, and a white mature lens. So it, 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 it had to come out there. But just, um, be, just before going ahead, sorry, Chris, uh, Lucan, yeah. what did you read this morning about the Zeiss three pieces IOL? What's happening in the market? Tell us. Uh, it's a discussion in iConnect uh, on ASCRS. Uh, Zeiss discontinued uh, to produce uh, the City Lucia with uh, PVDF haptics. They still have uh, old stock, but now the colleagues are complaining that they do not deliver. So the PVDF haptics probably will vanish, at least in Lucia type lens. For people who like Yamane, it's a disaster. It's a disaster because it's the only we have in the market with PVDF ha uh, haptics. Okay, guys, let's go ahead. So our friend Hassan Mortada from Cairo, a lovely country, Egypt. Please, the screen is yours. Okay, I want to show... Um, Two cases um, really um, for me uh, there were strange cases the first one was referred to me from um, a neighbor country with um, loss of vision following subtenum injection of trimstenolone yeah. um, so uh, she was a 65-year-old Sudanese female, medical history, she was diabetic. Your, your video is not running, Hassan. No, no, this is, okay. This is just to show you that the cornea was affected and um, it was difficult to remove the, um, 
the cataract, and also it was difficult to visualize the tip of the infusion um, uh, cannula um, during, at the beginning of the vitrectomy. Uh, the visual acuity was uh, in motion, the intraocular pressure was elevated, and um, she uh, had a dense cataract that was removed. And um, this is the picture. Okay. So, uh, thought vitrectomy, it's a combination of a mixture of hemorrhage and the triumphs in the loan. And um, I tried to peel the posterior hyaloid, and then using the uh, tissue manipulator, I tried to, uh, to scratch the aberrant trimethylone particles. And then you can see that the, they induce some sort of severe retinal ischemia. Over here, I tried to peel this membrane, but um, the underlying retina was so friable and so uh, ischemic that it was um, uh, impossible to do this without uh, tearing the, uh, uh, creating retinal break. And um, at any rate, I was, um, I intended... Hassan, sorry again, sorry again, sorry. The video is not playing. It's not playing. No, the video didn't play so far. Okay. With, with, is it playing now? Try uh, try to hit the space button. Press play. Let's see. Playing? No. No. Welcome back, Thanasis. Well, uh, I, I, I don't. This this isolated bits uh, doesn't have electricity. <laughs> so Hassan, try, try to share your screen again, please. Oh, okay, I'm trying. Can you see my screen now? Or? No. No. Yes. Can you see there it now? Yes. Yep. Yeah, okay, see. this is the second case. And, uh, okay. Um, Let's start by this case. It, um, it is a case of massive vitreous hemorrhage um, and regometogenous retinal detachment complicating subretinal injection of TBV and gas for hemorrhagic uh, AMD. And um, uh, he was a 75-year-old male. Uh, the right eye has this deformed scar. The left eye underwent vitrectomy, subretinal injection of TPA and gas. Uh, for management of subretinal hemorrhage complicating neovascular AMD since 45 days when he presented to me. He presented with lens vitreous uh, vision and the uh, pressure was high and the, sonar, the ultrasound revealed inferior bullous retinal. Yes. Can you see the video? Can you see the video? Yes, we can see the video. Okay. We removed the hemorrhage and then there was a bullous retinal detachment. Uh, so, and the massive subretinal hemorrhage, I decided to perform uh, inferior uh, 180 degrees uh, retinotomy, removing the subretinal hemorrhage and then uh, removing the um, uh, subretinal uh, choroidal neovascular membrane complex, which was very fibrotic. And you can see that. Um, it was a huge area of um, uh, uh, choroidal and RP atrophy. Um, so I prepared the eye to perform a choroidal patch graft. Uh, PFCL was injected under the retina to stabilize the retinal flap. And then um, this was uh, the only healthy area of the, uh, of the choroid and RPE. The other areas were 
um, affected by some atrophy and um, and I removed the uh, the choroidal patch graft uh, manipulating it under PFCL until uh, it was brought uh, over the area of uh, choroidal uh, atrophy beneath the uh, macular area PFCL was um, removed and um, uh, 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 everting the retina, PFCL was injected um, over the surface of the retina. And um, I made sure that the, um, the graft is uh, centralized beneath the uh, macular area. There was a retinal fold here that was um, flattened by a uh, tan scraper. And this is at the end of the operation, direct PFCL silicon exchange uh, was uh, performed. This is the time as silicon oil removal. The, uh, there was a slight movement of the uh, of the um, uh, disc the, of the of the graft, choroidal graft. Uh, it was a little bit eccentric, uh, but the vision improved from hand motion to um, 0.05. This is the uh, at the time of the operation. This is the end of the silicon oil injection, and this is the post-operative uh, picture. So this was the, uh, the first case. Uh, let me look for the... Uh, uh, So it seems that the, the second case was the second case was uh, lost from here. Okay, take your time, Hassan, because I know the other case is good as well. Okay. So what, what I would suggest close this one. Okay. Yeah. Then you first open the second case and then you share a screen. Take your time because you are here and really nice case. I know some people here also work with retina grafts and choroidal grafts. I want to listen to your opinions later because Hassan did it beautifully. Actually, we have a question here from okay. Julio Grijera. Why do you take the graft from inferior choroid? I think because the access is easier to manipulate. Uh, this is one reason, but the main reason is that the choroid and the RPE um, in many cases were um, so bad and uh, atrophic. And this was the only area from uh, where I can have a, a healthier RPE and choroid. Mm -hmm. So our friend Julio Grijera, thanks for the question answered. So I, I've done a few of these and, uh, and uh, with, with excellent initial results, uh, but uh, kind of a fibrotic degeneration of the uh, of the choroidal graft. Have you seen that at all, Hassan? Or your grafts stay stay uh, stay clear long term, or stay uh, functioning? The, the graft uh, remain functioning as uh, proved by um, uh, improvement in the visual acuity and um, uh, the the vision remains stable. Uh, this is by, by the only proof. So, uh, I guess it, it, in in the ones that I've done over time, the graft just starts starts getting this fibrotic transformation, and th the vision stays okay. But I'm yeah. worried about the fibrotic transformation, and I've actually thought about perhaps possibly using um, using intraocular methotrexate to prevent that fibrotic. Uh, transformation and, and some of our European colleagues have done these, and um, and have found that um, and 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 have published a fairly high PVR rate, and perhaps the methotrexate could help with that as well. Uh, I have tried the methotrexate in uh, cases of PVR, but um, in a large number of cases, it, it uh, did not work. So. Um... 
I cannot be sure that it will work in these cases. But um, uh, there are some fibrosis that usually occurs around the graft. Uh, but uh, I don't think it, it will affect the function of the graft because the vision remains stable and, um, and it was much better than before doing uh, the right. surgery. But if Gaston, you had a question, please. Yes, yes, I don't have experience with this patch graph. Uh, so for Riemann and for Mortada, I, I want to ask the visual results and for how long does the vision improve? Really, I, I never do this technique. Um, I, I think that the vision is, you, you, the, the problem with this in these cases is the recurrence of the um, areolar or geographic atrophy, even in the graft. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and this is not only for choroidal patch graft, but it also uh, occurs in cases of macular translocation. So I um, have cases of macular translocation that remained very successful and the patient enjoyed good vision and even reading vision. And then after five, six, 10 years, the patient start to develop um, uh, recurrence of um, uh, atrophy in, in the area where the macula was uh, translocated or in the graft place. So um, I think it is, uh, it is only temporary treatment. So, but it, 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 it lasts for a good time. Thanks, Carlos. One, there are two steps that are very important in this surgery. First is that to remove the blood is not that easy. Hazan, you know that. Stay 20 minutes with the retina making like this and the blood flowing there. It is, you know, this is a very bad moment. This is the first. The yeah. second thing is, as you showed in your case, that, you know, the, the graph was a little bit the center because you don't see where to go. And then you put the flap there and then it's very important to put it in the center because the fibrosis that Chris mentioned uh, happens in all cases because yeah. You have a huge area of RP, you know, um, you, you remove it and then you have this fibrous tissue around the, around the, around these, um, these, uh, the, you know, the, the graft. Yeah. Then, you know, but you know, this is a great case, but you know, there are two moments that they are very, 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 very difficult. And these are the yes, to overcome this hard time during removal of the hemorrhage because everything is cloudy and everything is, cannot see is to work uh, by manually, uh, just supporting the, the retina with a soft tip or uh, uh, instrument and then working with the probe gently. You should not aspirate except when you are sure you are aspirating really blood. And then once the media is clear, you inject the PFCO to stabilize the, uh, to stabilize the retina. Uh, we have a question from the attendees, Professor Mortada. How do you avoid bleeding? Do you use endocautery or laser for the edges of the graft? Um, I didn't mention that, but I do laser around the area intended for um, having the, uh, the graft from it. So it is laser and not diastermic. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, do you mind if we go ahead, Professor Mortada? Yes, we can see the second case. Can you see my screen or not yet? No. Not yet. Not yet. No? No, yes. There we go. Okay. Uh, as I said, it was an uh, ocular perforation. The patient was referred with loss of vision um, following a subtenium injection of trimsin alone. And um, the patient presented with um, partially clear uh, cornea as seen here and um, cataracts and uh, the pressure was high. And uh, after um, difficult time in removing the cataract, this was um, the uh, the view inside the eye. It was a mixture of uh, blood and trimsin alone. Uh, I tried to detach the posterior halide after removing the cloudy 
the cloud inside the vitreous, I discovered that the, um, the, uh, the retinal vessels are um, uh, mostly occluded over there, and uh, the retina was ischemic. There was a membranes of triumph loan uh, strongly adherent to the underlying retina. The retina was uh, friable and ischemic. I tried to peel these from the surface of the retina, but it was impossible to do this without um, tearing the retina. At, um, and I, in, I intended to do a retinotomy in order to remove this masses of uh, subretinal uh, triumphs alone. And um, so um, I tried to remove it through this small area, but it was impossible. So I have to um, remove the uh, good part of the retina in order to um, be able to remove the, uh, the subretinal uh, uh, triumphs alone. I removed the ILM, uh, anticipating that there will be uh, much proliferation, so as to protect the macular area. And I removed the, uh, the ILM as wide as possible. And then in, in order to remove the, the triumphs alone sheet over the retina, the RPE, uh, I have to remove this part of the retina. And uh, it was really a hard time um, trying to remove this adherent masses. It was extending to the retina and uh, probably this was the site of perforation. This, this area. So after succeeding of removing the um, most of the uh, triumphs and loan mass, I re reattached the remaining part of the retina with PFCO. Laser was applied and then the eye was filled with uh, silicon oil. The problem uh, came not from the retina, but it came from the cornea because after some time the cornea uh, decompensated when we have to perform uh, keratoplasty, uh, but there was some proliferation over the um, uh, area of the retina around the field eye lamb, uh, but the retina remained stable and the vision improved to two meters. Thank you. I don't know which of the cases was more difficult, but really well done. Thank you so much. It was a fantastic case. Any one of the participants want to share its opinion? Lucan, go ahead. Uh, I have an interesting question about the second case. Why you need to remove in first place the trance in alone under the retina instead of just plugging up the hole? Why I'm asking because I have developed a supracoroidal needle and we are using that um, almost two years already. And we are injecting supracoroidal primes in one, at least one and 1.2 ml. So what was the reason and the need to remove all that uh, quantity of trans in one and damaging the retina? Yeah, this is not injected, this was not injected in the supracoroidal space. I know about your needle. Uh, this is injected under the retina. And I think it, the, the high concentration, the high volume of triumphs injected cause a sort of retinal uh, toxicity. And um, you can see that the retinal vessels were ischemic, um, occluded, uh, the retina friable. So um, I have to get rid of, the, um, of this toxic material injected into the subretinal space. I don't know if any one of you have um, experienced uh, subretinal uh, volume, high volume of um, triumphal, uh, triumphal alone injected under the retina. So this was the only uh, solution in my hand. And it's uh, a matter of effect, one of our colleagues, which was banned from our team, Dr. Marashi, uh, managed to uh, implant superretinally a significant amount of uh, trans in one because his stopper of the needle was too short and there was nothing actually after that. 
Maybe, but you have seen that the, um, the, the retinal vessels are occluded and um, the retina was friable and hemorrhagic and uh, ischemic. And um, uh, I have to deal with, so I cannot um, uh, close the case with this mass of uh, subretinal trimestalone. And um, uh, I know that the retina is ischemic and uh, there seems to be uh, toxicity maybe from the preservative of the, uh, of the uh, uh, drug or from the high concentration of the drug. Uh, so it was, for me, it was um, a peculiar case. So I, I'll jump in here. I think, uh, Hassan, I, uh, I think I would have also probably removed it. And because the other reason to remove the, uh, the other reason to remove the, the triessence is be, uh, the, tri the, the catalog is because the, the the visualization of the anatomy you had a, you had uh, was not that good, and you know if you and you, you had to find where the retinal break was if there was a retinal break, um, in 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 order in, in, and and uh, and you have to get good retinopexia around the edges of the break which you can't do um, if you have a bunch of uh, a, a tri triamcinolone between the retina and the retinal pigment epithelium. Exactly. Okay, guys, very good. So go, let's go ahead because we are late on our, our schedule. Our next speaker, as Tanasi said, the best surgeon, Carlos Mateo. Please go ahead. Benvingots. I promised you I would learn Catalan for the next webinar. I'm on the way. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, always Tanasi is deriding on me, you know, and I think he doesn't think that, you know, but uh, you asked me to show you a complex case, complicated case of uh, um, vitreoretinal surgery. This is a case I had, you know, two and a half years ago was sent to me because a colleague had, you know, during the buckle bead um, surgery for a retinal, for a temporal retinal detachment, he had this problem with a massive subretinal hemorrhage. You know, he has light perception. Then I started to, um, uh, to do the removal of the silicone oil. I, as, as you saw, I removed the silicone oil using three, um, three sclerotomies, three, three ways. One is for the light, the other are active because this was what 5,700, you know, cent is so very difficult to remove under 23 gauge, you know. Then I perform lensectomy. I love lensectomies. Thanasis knows that. I know all of you would perform phagomulsification in this case. I love the, the view that you obtain with lensectomy. Look at the iris as it move. And then uh, you, you, you clean the posterior surface of the anterior capsule. Then, you know, here in difference to, you know, the Hassan, you know, problem, this patient has no retinal detachment. The blood is touching the, the RP and touching the retina. Then you, you, you have to, um, uh, to, uh, to detach the retina to remove this huge um, uh, subretinal uh, clot, you know. Then we are going to inject, this is, this is only fluid, this is not RTPA. I'm not going to, to wait for 45 minutes. And then I make a fluid exchange to make all of this fluid to collect, to detach the macro area. And I'm going to, of course, to cut the peripheral retina to remove this. I don't know if any, any any, any one of you would try to remove this severe clot, this large clot through a small retinotomy, don't try it because so big, so big that even with a large break in the retina, it's difficult to be removed. And, you know, I, I cut, you know, uh, 180 degrees and then I go down under the retina and then, you know, you begin these 20 minutes that you don't see anything. The retina is moving and the blood is, of course, the, 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 uh, the recording is, is, is uh, trimmed. Then, you know, you don't see it, but, you know, it's so difficult to deal with this hemorrhage. The blood is floating, the retina is moving. You can, you can grasp the retina, you can cut it more. Then, you know, I'm using in the, my left hand, I'm using a flexible loop. And in my right, uh, you know, I'm using the, the vitreoton tip. But, you know, this, this clot always tend to, if you, if you free it, you, you, it's going to go under the retina again then you know you have to maintain the cloth with with both hands it's so difficult in, in these cases then you, you're, you're going to eat the blood with uh, the uh, video gum tip you, you 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 remove more blood and more blood and more clot until the subretinal space is free of blood then you put a uh, perforocarbon liquid you are attaching the retina as you can see here with a flexible loop, I, I, you remove this, uh, 
this, you know, this fall preferables. I always, I agree with all of you. I always try to, if I, if I have, you know, visualization with the sector is perfect. And I always remove the interlimiting membrane to avoid membranes in the macro area. I remove as much as possible, as, as peripheral as possible. But, you know, you know, when you go to the arcade, it's so difficult. Then I do laser and the perform carbon liquid. Then at the end, you know, uh, silicone oil. I don't know if you would use gas in this case. Remember, what's slide percent? And you know, you don't know the visual prognosis of this case. Then, you know, this is the day after wonderful picture, and it is, you know, two weeks later, but this is three weeks later, and, and you know, PVR, you know, blood and retinal detachment means PVR. And then you have PVR, I remove again the silicone oil, as you can see here in two way with two, uh, two entry sites. And then I always stay under, under air. I prefer to stay under air because you stretch the folds and then the dye enters in contact with the, with the, with the membranes. And then uh, as you can see here now, we remove the dye and I always use to peel the PVR. I always use perfor carbon liquid. It's counteract my forces. You, you, you peel, and the peripheral carbon, you know, pushes down. Look at the, in the nasal side, you know, there is subretinal fluid. What does mean? This means that you don't have breaks in the nasal side because, you know, the fluid cannot go anywhere. Then very, 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 don't be rushed. Don't rush because, you know, the worst thing you can have here is breaks, small breaks in the mid periphery. These are very difficult to touch. This is, as Yusuke showed before, we're going to remove this membrane using both hands, trying to avoid to pull too much from the, from the, uh, here, I'm going to show another technique. This is a napkin, the napkin um, uh, use of the two forceps. You don't close the second forceps and then you pull the retina very gently, gentle down, he has to avoid to pull too much to the center of the, of the eye. Then, you know, in this way, I try to avoid, you know, peripheral breaks, small breaks that at the end will end with a re retinal detachment. Then, you know, with two hands and the before carbon liquids, again, don't, don't be rash. If you need to re-stain, re-stain to remove as much as possible these uh, epiretinal membranes and you will be able to uh, reattach the retina as you see here. I repeat, very important, try to avoid to reduce even tiny breaks in the mid periphery. Then I I'm enlarging now the, the island peeling in the, in the macro area. And I asked the patient this week to come again after removal of the silicone oil. I removed the silicone oil eight months later. And I, I put an IOL in the sulcus and you will see now the OCT in the, of the IOL and you know, the OCT and you know, visual acuity now is 2050, uh, 2040. Um, you know, the patient is very happy. Not that happy because the patient has some kind of diplopia. And my last question to you is, do you think that, you know, this is the phobia, phobia is here, the OCT shows perfect profile, but the phobia is here. My question to you, the other eye is 2020. Then my question is, uh, do you think that this is this, the cause of diplopia? And I tell you, don't, no, it's not. Because we, we were performing limited macro translocation. I have many cases like this, and you know, this diplopia disappears over time. That, but this patient has more than two years now, almost two years of follow-up. And, and you know, this is, the, this is the case I wanted to show. And that's done, there's only one case. Thank you so much. Amazing case. Yusuke, I want your comments on Carlos surgery, please. Well, it's a very tough case. Actually, it's a wonderful surgery, always inspired from your surgery. So the key point as uh, Carlos talked about uh, how much amount of membrane you can remove, otherwise can you will encounter the lip perforation. So do you always remove the membrane underneath the purple carbon? Oh, How do you remove the member up to the perfect area? Um, uh, in many cases, I use, if the patient has severe anterior PBR, that nowadays is so rare. But you know, if the patient has severe anterior PBR, I prefer to first remove the anterior vitreous base. Why? Because when you put perforal carbon liquid, you know, the retina remains detached. If you remove first the anterior traction, the retina reattaches. Then I always, just okay, I always remove the, the membranes under, under perforal carbon liquid. Counteract forces, open the folds, get, you know, yeah. 
I, 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 I clearly prefer this. Just like the third hand, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a third hand. Yeah, I have a video in '87 showing the third hand of the performed carbon liquid. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Um, I, uh, I I think we've seen a lot of really beautiful peels. Uh, many 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 of you showed fantastic peels. Which forceps does everybody use? What did you you, you had two forceps? It, it looks like it was a max grip and a and a four three. Let me tell what, you what did you? Yeah, let me tell you. I use the Baushan Lom and gripping in one hand. In the other hand, I use the the, the grip of uh, Alcon Alcon. Uh, you know forceps has no teeth. And, and but the, for me, for the island period, I'm sorry, I, I don't want to, I don't have any personal, you know, economical issues about this, but you know, I always use the end gripping forces from, from Pufu to peel the ILM in the membranes. And the second hand, I use other one, the, the Alcon is for me, perfect one. And, and the nice thing about the, and the end gripping forceps is that they open up a little bit so that you can, you can, you can, you can use, use them like a lasso to pull the membranes out. I, Absolutely. Yusuke, how about you? What forceps do you use for these cases? Okay. Well, usually I prefer to uh, use a uh, max grip. Max is one form. So only the very, very rare case, just a mild peak case. Very uh, high mild peak, high mild peak case in the very stern laser. At that time I use end gripping. Very good. I, I like the Grease Hubber from Alcon. Gaston, I think, is the same because I learned with him and you can change the tips. So I'm used with the handle. So it's perfect. You are used with the handle. Makes life easier. Lucan? The, the name of the, of the handle is the Revolution Handle. Yeah. I'm using Eckert and Gripping Forceps from Dork. Very well. Okay. Uh, I don't like, I, I, I prefer this than this. For me, this is so difficult to my hands. You, you have to ILM to, to grasp it. You know, with this, you have some, you know, you go there and, but you know, it's a, a matter of preference. You are used to use it, you know, it, you like it, you know. Yeah, the, be the best one is the one who works better in your hands. Of course, absolutely. That's it. Okay, guys, so let's move ahead. Our next speaker, my brother, co-organizer, Lokan Mishev from Bulgaria. So let me just mute here because we have some background noise. The beach. Do you see my, my screen? Yes, we do. So this is a case which is interesting because I'm the fourth surgeon here. The first one has put a buckle which failed. The same surgeon tried pneumatic retinopexy with gas. It failed. Then the second surgeon uh, tried uh, uh, pars plana vitrectomy with silicone which failed. And I was the fourth one to deal with the situation. As you see, I opened the conjunctiva because I plan to remove the buckle uh, and I replaced my trocas. So now, now you will see the lower part of the retina is detached and there is a good rim of PVR in the lower retinectomy. Here somewhere is the buckle which was uh, firstly done, and this is interesting mode, which is uh, sort of angular, but without fluorescing and only with modified uh, ingenuity color filters. So you can see at least the bezels. Uh, it's, it's, it is just a glimpse of what the ingenuity is capable if you are playing a lot with it. Now I remove the silicone. And then this is the picture that revealed under the silicone. There is a, already a pucker over the macula, which I will stain with the brilliant blue G. Then with the Eckert forceps, I will 
feel this membrane. And I completely agree that in PDR cases, at least the macula should be released from further um, PVR or ERM formations. And we can prevent that only with island peel. Here, the retina, I'll bite the touch in the lower part. It's not mobile, so I don't use PFCL at the moment for the peeling. If you can see on the left part and the nasal part, there is a drainage retinotomy, which was not even lasered. I find that really amusing. Uh, I like to use my, in my left hand, the cutter in order to stabilize the eye and also to remove the membranes in order to not float in the eye during my peeling. I like the end gripping forceps because it approaches the retina really gently. So damage it, at least in my opinion. And it works well in my hands. So I try to peel as far as possible in the periphery. Then I will cut the tension. I see this as a strand opened between the both sides of the retina and it pulls the lower part of the retina. And I really loved in our, uh, one of our previous webinars, Dr. Carlos Mateo showed how the retina is different diameter in the upper part. And when you do a retinectomy, obviously it will not fit the, uh, the, uh, the lower part, uh, the uh, equator, etc. So something needs to be done like a tailor to not uh, fit the area. Now I pull the PVR onto the edges. Then I, I really like the scissors because they cut clean and they don't leave anything behind. And I cut all that edge, which is PVR infused in order to remove it completely. I'm using Ingenuity, which provides a really good image. Actually. Now, here comes the tailoring part. These are few radial cuts in order to relax the retina. These cuts, of course, can promote a little bleeding, which is not an issue, especially when you are fast with the PFCL bubble. This is the third retinet, ret, radial retinet, retinotomy. And now here is the view under PFCL. Now look, where is the buckle? It's under the rectus. So it's obviously at least 11 millimeters from the limbus. Why I point that? Because next we will see where is the hole. And I don't know what type of buckle is this. This is something like a mattress, probably. I like to clean the far periphery over the retinectomy because we have remnant vitreous here and we have also sources of PVR. Here still we have a remnant vitreous. And I like to then and see up to the oral serrata without issues. I like to, uh, to do a laser over that area also in order to prevent any uh, PVR or neovascular complications later. Then you see where is the, the small hole which was originally uh, to be delayed about this uh, retinal detachment. It is near to the aura, so it's like five or max six millimeters from the limbus. Remember where was the buckle and what was the use of that buckle? I removed the buckle, 
because if it failed the first time, it is obvious that uh, the buckle doesn't cover the hole. Now, this is the uh, fluid air exchange, and I like to implant the silicone, not directly, but always after fluid air exchange, and that way I can judge if I can have a slippage or a folding or something else uh, with the retina. Now, this is the silicone implantation. This is the eye filled with silicone. And this is the end of the case. And something I missed to mention was that the eye was pseudo -fucky. So I want your comments on buckle on pseudo eyes also. Uh, and that is my case. Thank you, Lucan. So you did the fourth surgery of this eye? Yes. So he has been with other colleagues before. So Chris, you are a guy who should talk to Lucan more because he loves the ingenuity. He himself has improved the system, lowered the latency, and he can do amazing things. I want your comments on his surgery. I thought it was a beautiful surgery. I thought, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, it's interesting. I might have tried to leave the, it's, I, I, I couldn't tell because the, uh, there was a little bit of a lag uh, on my computer viewing it. Um, but uh, it looked, uh, it, Vanessa, can you mute yourself? I hear beach. I did. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, uh, uh, I, I, uh, I, I might have just done, so I, I agree with removing the, the scleral buckle. I wonder if the failed retinal detachment was simply the, 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 the failed previous surgery. I would have peeled the ILM as you did. I would have relieved that macular pucker. Um, I might have just done an air fluid exchange drained from the previous retinectomy, uh, the retinotomy, and then properly lasered that. That might have been all that I needed, but again, um, you know, if if you really think that that there was inferior traction that was the problem there, then then you did the right thing. I, I couldn't see it. I would then then you have to lift that and uh, and the idea of some radial relaxing incisions to make sure that the circumference of the retina in that in, in that meridian matches the circumference of the sclera makes sense. Thank you, Hudson Nakamura, please. Yeah, I want to comment on your case. I like doing, uh, Lucan, I always like to do for pseudo -phagic and aphakic patients, uh, the combined buccal vitrectomy. That works for me very good. We did that paper I mentioned uh, some minutes ago in Canada with uh, Dr. Diveni, Dr. Lem. And uh, I love doing buckles. You know, sometimes you have to remove the buckle because, uh, for example, this buckle was uh, just... Uh, uh, underneath the erectus muscle, so but I like doing for pseudo fakics in the a fakics. You get rid of the RPE and the, you, the likelihood of getting the retina attached is a lot better. Great case, great images, especially the one from uh, the angel and uh, ingenuity system. Very good, congratulations. Thank you, Professor Mortada. Any comment? No, um, uh, I think all the comments have been uh, said. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you so much. So let's go ahead. Last but not least, your humble moderator. Let me just open the video to share the screen. One second. Can you see it? Yes. Yes, we can. Mm -hmm. Okay, so before I start, let me just tell you the background of this patient. This is a 48 years old male who had a stroke many years ago. So now he's on a wheelchair. And three months ago, he has been assaulted by a gang of four. And they attacked him with knives and clubs. And now you're going to see what happened with this eye. So here you're gonna see, I could, you have a luxated nucleus, okay? 
here it's a little bit dark the image but i'm doing the vitrectomy since he is young we have a very dense vitreous so before touching the lens you have to perform a very good vitrectomy and you have even vitreous around the iris so i do a periphery you have to do a good periphery shaving otherwise you're gonna have some pvr but luckily he didn't have any retinal detachment here i'm trying to deal with the nucleus but it's too hard to be eaten and too soft to be chopped. So I put some PFO to protect the uh, posterior pole. And then I use the lollipop, the lollipop technique to try to chop it a little bit easier. So I could a little bit, but even so, after dealing with it uh, for a while, I couldn't eat it very much because it was too hard to be eaten. I tried the bicep technique from Tanasis and here's the rest. So I traveled back to the time and then I enter with the monster with a 20 gauge probe. And now look how beautiful and easy I can eat this nucleus, okay? I take the PFO out and now I'm going to perform a, a secondary implantation of IOL. The thing is here I had a tear, so I lasered it before. It was the only rupture I found when inspecting the periphery finished and, and the, let me give a stop here because I have to explain one thing and this is in the public hospital in the public hospital they don't have three pieces foldable IOLs just five millimeters or seven millimeters and I was tired of opening corneas and suturing and all and there was always some of astigmatism after that so I decided by myself to buy foldable three pieces IOL so I bought the MA6AC from Alcohol. I docked it in the needle very gently without rushing. Have done it. I leave one of the haptics out to make it easier. But what I didn't know is that these haptics are really fragile. They bend easily. So you're going to see when I come out, it's already a little bit bent. I make the flange. And now I'm going to deal with the other one look how bent is this haptic already so this iol will be twisted when i finish the implantation so to try to solve it i cut it as yamane has already shown he has an aura i don't to see the final so i try to organize it a little bit i bring it and when i did it i have broken the other haptic so since i am a stubborn guy i insist with the same iol look how the haptic is and now it's totally broken but I'm still really stubborn and I want to use the same IOL because it's already inside the eye. I dock it again in a 25 gauge needle because it's the only one I have there to make this job. I don't have thin wall needles. And here is the plot. When I'm dealing with it, I don't see the haptic. It's almost broken and you're gonna see that the IOL is going to fall but I just saw it later when I was still dealing like a fool with the haptic. Just pay attention in the next seconds how it's going to happen. Now I hold it, look, went down. And I'm dealing with here. I didn't see it yet. I think I'm holding the IOL. I'm not. I do the flange. When I get, take it out, it's down. So I go fishing. I get it. I bring it up. Then I bring it outside so there is no more use for this one. So I cut it. I use the Pac-Man technique. I give a good cut until the middle, a little bit farther than the middle. So with another uh, forceps, a curved one, as I like, I bring it out without opening the wound, the incision, sorry. So now I decide to use the basket technique from Dr. Samuel Masket, where we pass a double arm wire okay like a hashtag like a, a net this technique now has many names so i do it very gentle i bury the knots that it's been, been already previously shown and then i put the iol on it centered very good position i like the technique you can also capture the haptic if you want i didn't and now i'm gonna do a pupilloplasty here but the thing is the the surgical field is bothering me a little bit and I have to be really careful, otherwise the tip of the needle 
my cut the uh, the proline 10 zeros which i have already passed ideal is nine i just have 10 so i pass i pass again and then i go there i use four openings to do it the regular technique is three so i have already passed on the superior part now i'm going to the ender part and here again i was really tired this patient was tired this is a, this was a surgery with more than two hours i do the suture the iris is not perfect it should be the pupil and that's the end of the case the patient is really happy because he wasn't seeing nothing and poor guy a miserable condition your comments guys whoever wants to talk case great yeah. in case you're great. really stubborn you're really stubborn yeah <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, just when, you are, uh, when you are a retina guy, uh, uh, the thing is, I could have done many steps, many surgeries, but this guy, ah, and I forgot to, to, to say you, besides being on a wheelchair, he also has one of the legs amputated because he had osteomyelitis. So I wanted to do everything in a, on, in a, in a unique surgery and make it set him free. Let me ask you, Gustavo, to you and to Christopher, because Christopher is showing to do Yamane technique using the 27, you know, cameras. and you show uh, using the, you know, the, you know, the needles, okay? But at the end, when we think about the, you know, um, the, the channel you create, you don't create a channel, really, because you enter and then you go 40, uh, uh, 90 degrees to the center just to see it, you know, because you can put it in. Then how you manage? Is you, uh, Chris, you, you use needles or you always need cannulas and you, uh, Gustavo, you, uh, how do you manage this? So when I, when I, uh, when I plan a Yamani, which is rare, so I, I, uh, I, I showed a Yamani just because that was an interesting case. It was a syndromic eye. It was uh, an anticoagulated patient. Um, and, and I didn't want to do my usual technique. So my usual technique, if I'm going to put in an IOL and I want it to work, and I want it to be a bulletproof solution that lasts forever. Um, I don't, I, the, the Yamanis, they're fine when they work and I showed a case where they worked, but honestly, um, I'll sew in a CZ70 lens with Gore-Tex, with sclerotomies. Um, and, and those, the, I, I've, I, you know, they last forever. You, as long as you rotate the knot intraocularly, the, the Gore-Tex doesn't erode. You don't get into issues and problems. That's a very nice, very stable, long-term result. And I've been doing that since 2003. Um, so I, I'm going to stick with that. So answering to your questions, Carlos, there are some issues here I have to explain to you. So most of the surgeries I do in the public hospital, they just had until this month. Actually, the surgery was performed two days ago. I want to thank Luke and who helped me to edit it because I had a problem with my PC. So going back, we just had five uh, millimeters PMMA IOL, okay? So, and the haptics are also from PMMA. They are thicker, okay? And also better to work. So when I do the incision and I do the flange, when I, I burn the tip, when I push it back, okay, it will be steady. It won't cross the holes and I cover it with conjunctiva. This surgery I showed you was my first case with the MA60 and it was a disaster. I also like doing uh, for secondary implantation, the technique which I showed you, the basket from Masked in LA, I think he's in California. And that technique I like really much. The only thing I must change is because I'm using 10 zeros per lean and you should do it with nine. What I do different from masket, I don't open the conjunctiva. I do it on the conjunctiva because after 15 days, it will be epitalized. So you don't have the knots outside of the conjunctiva. I think Yusuke want to talk about Yamane because they work together or work it together. So no, with uh, the Yamane technique, the very nice technique, I will show the video later. The key point is, you know, uh, the one big key point they use uh, the large side lens. The total lens should be more than 13 millimeter. And as shown here, the Alcon Arctic lens is too small and have it too fragile. So initially I also tried to use the same thing with this lens, but also failed several times. So that's the reason why we 
gave up, they will no longer use this type of lens. We now use a very specialized large size lens for this technique. And the one key point I'll show you here is, uh, I'll show you the video. Sorry, Yusuke, which IOL are you using now? Which what? Which IOL are you using for Right now the... I use the Sun 10, Sun 10 oh, IOL. Sun 10. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Otherwise, use the, uh, otherwise you can also, the AMO you can use, the side because the side. Another one key point is, you know, at the I will show you the video. Uh, uh, while Yusuke charged his video, Carlos, the thing is, I bought it by myself. Video? No, not yet. Uh, can you see the video? No. 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 Gustavo, we, we know that there's a lot of, of variants of, of the Shamanian techniques, but Today, I prefer to do a scleral pocket for the optic. I think it's safer, mm -hmm. uh, but that's an opinion. But that's oh, sure, sure. The question for you, for all of you. My question is, you have a luxated lens in the eye. The, eye is, uh, the, the lens is perfect. You, don't, you have the back down and you don't have any support in there. What do you prefer? You prefer to exchange the lens or to try to, 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 to re-engage the lens? Actually, actually Lucan has the answer, but I want to talk first. The, <laughs> the mask technique was invented because an IOL was inside the eye and he didn't want to change it. So you can bring it up, do the net. And now as I have many Alcon IOLs, I'll have to improve this technique and try to make the optic capture to button it. Lucan, go ahead. I completely agree with the question of Dr. Mateo. I will I research whatever lens is inside if the lens is okay. So why I should open the eye, remove it, and then to sclero search or something else. Without the risk, all the risk to open it. Sure. Of course. And hemorrhages and all of this stuff. And yeah, absolutely. And, and so and sometimes also an economic issue. Sure, 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 of course. Of course. Uh, Yusuke, can you share your screen? So I try to show you, but I can find right now. I just wait a moment. Just wait a couple minutes. I could embed okay, it. Okay, we, we keep point. talking. Chris want to say something. So um, th there's also one thing that we all have to remember. Um, nobody ever went blind from aphakia, right? So, I mean, I understand a sick old guy that may not have the money for, for contact lenses. I, I, I understand why you did what you did. But in, in many cases like this, the drive to do everything with one surgery is 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 um, may not be what's best for the patient. I agree. You know, this is a traumatized eye. You know, take out the lens, let it settle down. Don't beat the heck out of the endothelium. Don't beat the heck out of the iris. Um, you know, leave the eye aphakic and then live to fight another day if you need to, or just give them a contact lens. Contact lens, you know, I, you know, I, 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 I'm a huge fan of the CZ70, the, the PMMA seven millimeter lens. I agree strongly with what Yusuke said. Um, you know, the, you, you know I, I like large optics. I like large haptic cord lengths. Um, um, you know, the downside to the, P, to the seven millimeter lens is you have to make a, a scleral tunnel seven millimeters, and then you have to sew that tunnel shut. I'm old, I have gray hair. I, I, I learned how to, how to cut and I learned how to sew. So I feel very comfortable doing that and the results are fantastic. And, and you can do that surgery very atraumatically if you know how to sew and if you know how to cut. Yeah, Chris, before Yusuke plays his video, I agree with you 200%. It was a special situation, but you have to give the eye the time to rest and to recover. If it was a regular patient in a regular situation, I would have done it in two or three steps, maybe. The only thing I want to point, pupilloplasty, I passed the iris around the middle two, I should have passed more times because I passed like five times between each stop and you should do it six or seven times. Okay, oh, you can should. Can I see the video? Can I see yes, the video? Yes. yes. Let me just show you here. You know, this, uh, right now we, I just, you know, uh, just show you here. I just insert the one haptic into needle, right? Uh huh. Yeah, just put it in it and leave it as this. Don't pull right at this point. Don't move it. And then don't care about it inside. It will not touch the retina. And then leave it as this. And then you see on, 
do the another how hold another half dx like here if we put it put it once you put the one side it's not easy to insert another one just like you would twist the haptics to make it broken so then just leave the haptics inside as this and then insert another needle here and then guide it like this way. So you may keep with not, uh, not easy to broken the haptics right here. And then the key point is rotate the lens at the same time. Rotate haptics at the same time, right here. And gently move it and keep this position. And take out one haptics and immediately make the front Keep it there outside, and then gently move another one side. So we have less chance to broken the haptics. And right now you can gently adjust the point position, rotate it back, adjust position. Oh, but this, these haptics are similar to Lucia, right? To size. Yeah, sure. Yeah, they are totally different. The the Alcon, the first touch, the first first touch I gave on it, they were folded. Yeah, the Alcon one yeah. it's not easy to use for this uh, procedure, so it may use it uh, much more thickened haptics, maybe not easier uh -huh. to. You should. And get then you can you can cut out the haptic and adjust the the, the size and the position. You should. Very easy. I continue not seeing clear why you have to maintain the needle in your left hand. This is one question because you know at the end, if you, if you remove one of the ends, you do the flange and you put it as you are doing now, then you know right. the yeah. elasticity. If, if you put this way, put the outside yeah. first, it's, then you know, just the lens already, oh boy, just wait for me. I'll keep it, stop. So if you want to remove it outside here, Okay. That means another haptics will become this way. Yes. Right. Yeah. So it's not easy to take it back to insert to the needle. Yeah. You may twist, you may easily broken the haptics and it twists the haptics to insert the another side. So, right? So keep it this way and the insert this way. You no, don't load it so first. And after you adjust the two, insert the two needles inside and then load it this way, uh, in, uh, rotate at the same time, you may have less chance to broken the haptics. And then the second thing, I, I, I use sequentially. I, I remove one first and then next the second one. And the second question, Yusuke, which is the haptic that is more difficult to insert? And I think is the, in, in, your, in your video is, is the right one. Is the, is yeah. the needle is facing you. And why not to first to put this, you know, um, haptic first, and then you go to the inferior optic that this is. Yeah, yeah of course you can do that one. Of course you can do, just uh, uh, de depend on the surgeon's preference. For me to insert this first one, my adjustment is much easier. Of course you can do the opposite side. Of course, it's just up to you. The one point is I just uh, for, uh, instructed by Yamane, uh, my colleague told me, load at the same time, but easier to keep the point, uh, keep the position and have less chance to encounter the broken, the haptics. Uh, answering to your question, Mateo, for sure the second haptic is more difficult. And Dr. Brian Kim from USA, he has an interesting technique. He does a paracentesis on the farthest side, side. So he put the first haptic out, then the proximal one, he crosses it, and then he works with the with the with the first haptic. I think that's a good technique. Yeah, Gustavo, but I I, I would mention this because what I do is to take profit that the lens is inside. Then if it's inside, then it's better first to do as Kim do it, inserting a new lens. Uh -huh, first, uh -huh. the upper haptic and the inferior haptic. Oh, I agree, I agree. Yes, yes, yes. And like you, I, I, don't, I don't like to have two needles inside the lens. I have the first one, I do the flange, and then the second one. I think, I think. Yeah. I'm sorry, I don't know if I'm... Uh... If I can, uh, if I can speak or not, because yes, I have my, 
of course. Okay, I have, I have my telephone uh, now working. Uh, there are two issues for the people who are not used to that. The issue they think every lens can get in and every needle is the same. No. The needles should be a wide bore needle and you need to give directions which needle you're using. It's not for every needle to do that. And the lens should have a strong haptic and tough enough to withstand the entering of the eye because so many needles are not good for this so many haptics that we have in every lens. So we need to have some instructions that this is good, this is not, like you did before. And uh, uh, people think that you're holding the left, the, the one, the, the one uh, haptic with the needle in front of you and you're holding it and then you use the other haptic to touch the needle. No, you just leave the haptic inside, you leave the needle inside and you get your two hands in order to get a handshake technique to leave the end. And the most difficult thing is to lift the lens before going downwards. Because if you leave one haptic inside and you go for the other, the lens, because it's heavy, it's going down. So I love Yusima's technique that he went behind the lens, lift it up first, then grasp it, then doing the handshake. So there are steps that you have to follow one by one. If you want to, look, to use this technique, if you want to use another technique, that's another issue. But for this technique, I, I, I fully agree uh, for that the Yamani have to have steps and issues that they are not familiar with everybody. And it's, I, I, I also agree with uh, Matteo that it's another story to reposition a lens that already is dropped inside, it's a, that you, have, you don't have choices. And another thing to put the lens inside the eye when you, as, a, as a secondary implantation. This is two different things. Lucan? Uh, my, uh, my talk will be completely different. Can I tease you with few images of uh, intraoperative floral vitrectomy? Yes. Of, uh, and of course, of course, bring the images. We are here to learn with it with each other, please. So just a second. But yes, then as Thanasis mentioned, the handshake technique for these situations is amazing. It works really well. Uh -huh. Yeah, this is a video, which I believe will be perfect. <laughs> We have the sun, but I didn't see anything. You don't see anything? No. Okay. So I will be... The stop. Just... Yeah, it... oh, open the video first and okay. then you share screen. Can you see the picture now? No. Your desktop. Yeah, but this is the picture over the desktop. Uh, okay. no, there are some videos there and a folder. Wow, sorry. Is it in the tilted one disc? Yeah, this is one of the pictures. A picture? Yes, yeah. but it's not seen. You have in another desktop, perhaps. This is a Mac. Yeah, the, exactly. And perhaps you have another screen? You have two screens? No, it's one. But let me check again. Yeah, you, I think you have to open the picture first and then share screen. Zoom is a little bit lazy. Today is Saturday. <laughs> OK, let's see now. Uh, I enjoy that the technical, the te 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 technology of Matteo. The image? <laughs> yes, now yes. Oh, okay. So this is how the fluorescein can help actually when you, when you play with your filters in the ingenuity. This Probably is the flu vitrectomy, uh, Lucan. What? This is the fluo vitrectomy. Uh, as I call it, it's part of the chromo vitrectomy, but it's good because uh, uh, it is like uh, uh, for floral one. 
let me just show one picture. Just a second. Uh, here I had somewhere a glowing. Yeah, no, we, are, we are not seeing just your desktop. Again. Oh. Yeah. You have so, to stop okay. sharing, open it, and then share again. So I'll jump in while he's doing that. I think that um, I think that we're just looking at the tip of the iceberg with uh, with with chromovitrectomy, with fluorovitrectomy, and those sorts of things. And I think the thing that we have to understand um, is so I've, I've I've been in the operating room with several of my colleagues uh, using uh, using Ingenuity, and what they think looks good sometimes i don't think looks good and what i think looks good they don't think looks good we all see color a little bit differently and the really nice and powerful thing about ingenuity is i think we're going to be moving in the direction of customizing the screen settings and the display of color the color palette the color space customizing that to the way each and every one of us sees color I had a, a, a trainee se several years ago that had a subtle uh, a red green color defect. And this poor kid had difficulty peeling ILM because he couldn't see the green, which we use, which we use here. So you know, now I'm pretty sure he's using blue, but we were able to shift the color palette um, on Ingenuity and display it, and, and, and take the entire hue more towards uh, more towards the blue end of the spectrum, and all of a sudden he could see what was obvious to me, but was not obvious to him. He could see it, and then he turned into a fantastic surgeon. So, and, and each and every one of us sees color a little bit differently, and uh, and I'm I'm encouraging our uh, our, our our friends uh, developing 3D systems to dive into that with a little bit more um, uh, uh, with a little bit more attention to detail because I think there's real value that we can uh, uncover there for surgeons and for patients. Lokan, try to share your picture now, please. Let's no, see. No, I, I give up and uh, uh, Christopher <laughs> said everything completely right. We need to adjust the image to our preference, not to use the preset values. And the good thing with the ingenuity now is that they have a preset modes, but you can create your own modes and to play with color channels, hue, saturation, exposure, etc. Yeah, very good. Another thing is that 8% of the male population has some kind of Daltonism in different degrees. So we all see colors different, okay? Women can see. 100 million colors, but we men, we have some limitations on our color vision. 100, 100, something like this. <laughs> okay. Uh, each one of us has a different white length peak. Each one of us. If you can measure the wavelength peak, yours is different than mine. So if you can adjust the peak of the white length, in your ingenuity with yours, you're going to have the better vision. Then it comes from a vitrectomy. Then it comes uh, different things of uh, focusing and refocusing again. But all these things, don't tell them all together. Because if somebody wants to use the ingenuity, he would say, do I have to be an expert on color, on dyes, on everything to do a surgery? Uh, don't go too technological about things because you can do 99% of things without thinking about this. This is improvement, but don't stop people thinking that we make things complicated for them because we don't want them to participate in what we are doing. Okay, don't stop them from coming. Oh, you are saying generate is like democracy. When you have too many options, you make a mess. That's it? <laughs> no, you just tell them that you, you cannot get into the club. It's too difficult to get to the club because you have to know chromovitrectomy, you have to know this, you have to know that. And uh, this is uh, like a, a beautiful telephone. There is a lot of things you can do with it, but you, there are some people who know just the cold people. They don't do anything else. So uh, if you want to, exp for example, your iPhone 11, I don't know any one of you or me or anybody else who knows what you can do with it. You can change your TV screen, you can uh, open your car, you can 
regulate your uh, air conditioning. But who's doing that? True, totally true. So guys, it's almost midnight in Japan. Yusuke has operated the whole day. It's time to finish. People are tired. So first of all, Hudson, 30 seconds for your considerations. Yeah, it was my honor again to be with you. I learned a lot, you know, and uh, great case. It's really tough case. I thought my case was a little tough, but not as much as yours, you know, with these ILMPOs and uh, everything. And I uh, really learned a lot, enjoyed a lot, especially uh, you know, cases from every, everybody. And uh, for me, I would uh, vote Hassan for the best case because, you know, this uh, RPE transportation was cool. Thank you very much for having me. Obrigado, Hudson. Gaston, your last considerations, 30 seconds, please. You're muted, Gaston. Thanks for the invitation. Terrific webinar. Thank Luca, thank Gustavo, thank all the, the panelists here. Muchas Very gracias. good. Tanasis? Uh, I I think that uh, the most important thing is the, uh, that you met with Misev. Uh, the, uh, the cocktail of Misev and honey is extraordinary. You're doing everything that no one of us can do. So keep doing it and keep doing it and all the way because you're, you have a lot of future in front of you. We just have to show you experience. And last, last question is to Mortada. How many patients per year is he doing vitrectomies? Mortada, how many? How many patients I'm doing? Yeah, every year. Every year? Um, don't tell the taxes. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no taxes included. Uh, it's around uh, 800. 800 uh, vitrectomy, okay. not uh, not including silicone oil or uh, it's, um, diabetic. How many? Oh no, no. How many cases every year? How many cases? Not vitrectomy. How many cases every year? How many cases? No, I only vitrectomy. So I only. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, now, now you know how you have so much experience, more experience than any one of us. I'm doing a lot of surgery, uh, just like every one of you. So no, no, no. We don't. We, we just extend to the Greek population, which is just okay. a, a small okay. part. Uh, sorry, just on your on the, the comment uh, before you said before, we we are drinking from the fountain. So you guy, all guys here have <laughs> the credits. Okay, thank you so. Efharisto uh, Elada, Oshima, thirty seconds. Your last comments. Oh, thank you very much for inviting me to this um, nice meeting. Very glad to see the old friend and new friends. And uh, right now here at midnight, a little bit sleepy, but very worth to join the meeting. I learned a lot from you guys. Thank you very much for your guys. Enjoy. Arigato gozaimashita. Arigato. Uh, so thank you for a great meeting. Thank you for organizing this. Thank you all for fantastic presentations, fantastic cases. Um, I always learn more than I than than uh, than, than I teach at these, because all of you are a lot smarter than I am. Um, two uh, two things to just kind of hit home for the audience. I think that um, don't be afraid to remember that sometimes what's old is new, and what's new is old. Um, we we talked about buckling today, and buckling is really. Uh, fallen out of favor, and there are many, many, many. Um, uh, there are there are many uh, uh, training programs that don't even teach scleral buckling. That's a mistake. Um, you know, if uh, you know when if you're training residents and training fellows, take a couple of pig eyes, shoot them with a BB gun, and, and in in the lab, and and have them sew the corneas together. You have to know how to sew. Have them do some nice scleral groove and tunnel incisions and, and learn how to do that. It's not that hard. If you can peel internal limiting membrane, if you can suture secondary IOLs, if you can do you know, uh, uh, RPE transplants and all sorts of amazing, crazy things like that, then you can make a scleral groove and tunnel incision like they did in the extra cap days 40 years ago, and you can do that well. You, and, 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 and you can learn how to sew and close a wound. So that's what I would uh, say. Please remember what's old is new 
and, uh, and, and that'll help you. I have to sign off. Thank you, everyone. It was a joy. Uh, thank you so much. That was a yeah. bullseye. We even had today to engage surgery, so it was nice. Mortada, please, 30 seconds, your last comments. Thank you all for um, such beautiful, interesting cases. I really learned a lot from you. And um, uh, I can see that you are all committed to your work. You love your work. And uh, without this commitment and, work and love to the work, we cannot continue working on these uh, difficult and complicated cases, spending a lot uh, of hours from our lives uh, doing in the operating room, operating, trying to do the best for our patients. So um, it is a great opportunity to see you all and uh, I hope to see you um, uh, in real uh, soon. Shukran Ahuya. Carlos Mateo, your last comments. I would say more, more things, you know, you, you said everything. Thank you for having me here. I enjoyed a lot and, you know, the discussion and everything. Thank you very much and stay safe. Gracias. Lucan? I just want to thank to everybody attending this webinar. It was an honor and uh, your presence here was miraculous. Thank you. I learned a lot. So thank you all. I'm sorry. Uh, we, were, we were expecting to do a, at maximum two hours and we had three hours of webinar. I'm sorry for that, but discussion is always great and we lost ourselves in discussion. Have a nice weekend, guys. Take care. Be safe. Be healthy. And Bye. I hope to see you soon in person. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye. Bye.